<laughs> oh, Avi, you didn't put the example of the okay. bad argument there. And we are oh. live. So, um, hi everyone. So uh, I'm joined again with Dr. Avi, and uh, Ask Yourself is also here. So Mike the Vegan has responded to our debunk on heart disease reversal, uh, specifically coronary, uh, no, sorry, atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. Uh, I think Mike just used a more general term, just heart disease reversal in his video. Uh, but we're going to debunk his video again. And uh, Ask Yourself is here uh, to help uh, help with some of the debunk. Okay. All right. Um, Isaac, you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, I'll just say a few things first. Um, so um, I'll just put out a plea at this point to Mike to engage in conversation. Um, you may not like me. That's okay. Um, I don't, you don't have to like me. I don't expect you to like me. I know I can be rough around the edges, but, and I know I can be rude at times, but what I do expect is if I put out an argument or put out something valid and sound, then I expect you to agree with it. Or if you disagree with it and you misrepresent my position to 300,000 plus uh, subscribers, um, and I expect you to either publicly or privately interact with me. Um, you don't have to, obviously. It's just, it's just going to take a lot more time and effort for the both of us to continue going back and forth, making response videos to each other instead of conversing with each other. Um, it's also easier to... In to get to the truth in a more timely fashion if we respond to each other in real time rather than going back and forth on video. So let's just talk if you're willing, all right? Uh, because other than that, I, I, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm going to spend my time doing these video responses. I'm not going to let pseudoscience go rampant and run amok in the vegan community. I, I can't do it. Uh, and if that means spending my time doing this instead of what I could be doing, like debunking carnivores or whatnot, so be it. I'll do it because I'm not pouring dirt on their meat before we can even wash our own vegetables. So <laughs> well said. Yeah. So I guess um, these guys just wanted me here to talk a little bit about logic at the start. Really, Avi could do it. I'm not going to say anything that important. Uh, well, it is super important. Sorry, that um, complicated is what I should say. Avi could do all this, but whatever. I'm happy to go through it all. And I'll just add, um, you know, I've defended Mike for a long time. Avi will attest this. I've spent countless hours of my life defending uh, Mike against Avi. I've always said Mike has good intentions. Mike isn't, uh, you know, he's just confused about some topic or another. But, uh, you know, when he publicly mischaracterized Avi and then refused to engage in any discussion, it's like, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put up with someone treating one of my friends like that, right? You're just gonna misrepresent him to your massive audience and then refuse to have a conversation with him. So no, you pull that kind of shit. And I'm sorry, but I'm also going to join and fire back. So yeah, let's, uh, let's just go over to the study archive section on logic. Um, this is right kind of at the beginning. Uh, if you look in the reversal of heart disease section, you'll see logic introduction. And we're just gonna go through some of what we have here. So <clears throat> I'll just read this. Uh, so before exploring Mike's various empirical er errors, there's a fundamental philosophical point that has to be addressed. I cannot overemphasize how fundamental what I'm about to say is. And before saying it, I'll note that I understand the reluctance people interested in empirical topics often feel towards learning any philosophy. I get it. You want to talk about heart disease or politics or economics, not syllogisms. But that doesn't stop philosophy from mattering, and it doesn't stop your unwillingness to put in the requisite time from leading you to make certain completely predictable mistakes. The fact that Mike failed in the way I'm about to describe is completely predictable, given that he hasn't put in the requisite time with philosophy. So here is the point. Mike completely lacks any kind of comprehension of logic. Logic is one of the four major areas of philosophy alongside meta uh, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. A massive amount of his video, when examined from the perspective of one acquainted with formal logic, is not actually addressing the argument. This is arguably a worse problem than any of the empirical blunders, of which there are many. This is a fundamental failure. 
A formal argument is a delicate device, and Mike's ham-fisted attempt to address it is a product of his not understanding how it works. The mark of a good argument is soundness. Soundness is the combination of validity and true premises. Validity means that it's logically impossible for the conclusion not to follow from the premises. Validity can be shown with truth tables, truth trees, natural deduction, etc. In this argument, since we don't need to use a particularly complicated logic, we opted for truth, tra uh, truth tables. If you examine the truth table for a valid argument, you'll see that there is no row where all the premises are true, that's marked by ones, and the conclusion is false, that's marked by zeros. So here's an example of a valid argument. Can you bring that up on screen, Richard? Um, I Do I have to go into a particular Discord? Um, yeah, I go to... Just, no, that's fine. I'll just yeah. copy it to him. That's, that's okay. Here, I'll paste it into our conversation window. Can you okay, bring sure. that up? Yep, sure. I have it and on I'm screen. Gonna, okay, and then I'm going to post one for after that. Um, yeah, okay. And here's one more. So if you open up the first one, just say yep. one or two things. It's on screen. That. So, okay, great. So if you look at that, you'll see that there's a variables column, there's premises, and there's conclusion. We won't get into all the details of how you construct a truth table, but you just have to notice one feature, okay? There is no row in the argument table, that's the part with premises and conclusion, where the premises are true, as in they both have ones, and the conclusion has a zero. Now, if you go to the next image that I linked, and just tell me when you have that on screen. Okay. <clears throat> you'll see that there is a row where the premises have ones and the conclusion has a zero. That means it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Okay, so now picking up. So as you can see, it's possible for the premises of the invalid argument to be true and the conclusion false. The row demonstrating invalidity is highlighted in red. The only way that a valid argument isn't sound is if at least one premise is false. So what we've done is actually build a tree of interconnected arguments, and there are only four endpoints in the tree. You can think of a deduction tree like a series of buckets and think of falsifying the central argument as pouring water into the buckets. I'm going to copy you one more image so you can just open that up whenever, whenever you're ready. All right. So there's only certain areas the water, aka the falsification, can flow without breaking the walls, aka violating logic. So here's a diagram modeling the argument in terms of water flow. And as you can see, there are only four endpoints, each marked with a golden ball. What Mike must do to falsify the argument is deliver an argument that is sound and concludes that one of the premises marked with the golden balls is false. I've even included templates in the bottom. Uh, so this is in the archive section. You can find this here. I've even included templates that show valid argument forms. So uh, if Mike wants to create um, an argument to falsify one of these premises, he can use one of these valid forms here if he wants to ensure that his argument is valid. So if he, if he doesn't like that, he can take it up with the discipline of logic, and there's not really much else to say. So the core takeaway, you can go read all that stuff that I just read. I've written it all down. It's in, um, it's in the archive section. The core takeaway is that Avi has built an argument that is formally valid and it's structured into a tree where the premises of the main argument are supported by supporting arguments whose conclusion is word for word identical to the premise that they're supporting. So if you want to attack an argument like that, it's going to bottom out in having to attack one of the endpoints of the argument. So. Again, in the image with the water buckets, they're all marked with a gold ball. You can find them if you look at the actual deduction tree. And there's even templates included on the picture of what the arguments have to look like if Mike wants to attack any of these four positions. So if he makes another video and it doesn't actually involve an argument in one of these structures specified here, attacking one of these positions, he's just not interacting with the argument. I know people like to pretend they're being logical, right? Pretend they're addressing things, convince themselves they're making sense. No, okay? That's what you have to do if you want to attack the argument. And if we see anything short of that, then I just don't know what to say. You're just skimping on the work you have to put in in terms of logic to actually deal with the argument in front of you. So yeah, that's all I have to say. Okay. 
I'll start off by going over why this is so dangerous. And I'll share my screen for in the Discord for why. So before we get into why this is pseudoscience, and it is, I'll just use that word, this is pseudoscience. It's dangerous pseudoscience. Um, and for people who, I know Mike has said in the video that he doesn't seem to take the view in conjunction with rejecting statins, with rejecting medications, modern medicine that doctors prescribe. But this myth has fostered that behavior. And the number one upvoted comment on Mike's video, okay, the number, not most amount of likes is this. A patient saying, diagnosed with heart disease five years ago, never filled the scripts for statins, went whole foods plant-based, reversed in six months. Doc said she never seen anything like it. I said she might want to read a bit, LOL. But seriously, I appreciate Mike and a lot of other people and books that helped me stay on this path. This is just disgusting. This is dangerous. This is not the message we want to send. This is the message it fosters, okay? If it didn't, I don't think this would you would see. And by the way, the comments under that are mostly the majority of pe of comments either agreeing or disagreeing are agreeing and and like clapping and saying like yeah you go or something like that. So and it was only until I posted this on my Twitter that some of the comments like outright said like no this is actually not what we should be doing. So this is not just pseudoscience; it's dangerous pseudoscience. And I'm not saying just to be clear, I'm not saying this is Mike's fault. Okay, even though. Look, it could be that he didn't see this comment, uh, even though it's number one comment. He didn't respond to it, disagreeing with it, or he didn't do something. Fine, whatever. Even if he didn't, I'm not saying it's his fault, but this is the behavior it fosters. And we need to put an end to this. This needs to stop. Let's just start with Mike's video then. Okay. Do you, uh, are you the one streaming Mike's video in the share, um, Richard? Um, it could be any one of us. Like okay. you could, um, you could. Do I have to. Um, share if you I want. have to screen share. I have to screen share in the study archives for a lot for a lot of the points because we're going to be going going over Mike's. Um, we're going to be going over both Mike's videos. So Mike has a video that he put out. He also has a slide deck. We're going to be debunking both of them uh, just for the sake of completeness. Completeness. Okay, sure. So it, it'll be easier if you're the one streaming um, the video and. I'll I'll screen share for the slide deck. Okay, well, I've got the video right. up now. All right, awesome. So let's go point by point. Disease reversal video. Do we need another one? Probably not. I'm making it anyway. If you're following my community post, you probably saw that there was going to be a pretty epic debate, and it was then delayed, and now it's officially canceled, unfortunately. We don't need to focus on why it got canceled. I'll just say that it crumbled from both sides. Dean Ornish was- Yo, okay, you wait, wait a second. The okay. preview is being weird. Um, I think... Always ready to go till the end. Wait. We've just paused the preview to save you resources. Why the fuck are you doing that? Okay, that's stupid. Uh, just a second. What you need to do, you don't want to screen share that. You want to capture that screen with OBS and just play it on your computer. Obvi's just got a oh, remote so he okay. can see it on his computer. Well, I'll just, I'll just put it on my screen then. You can't see a video. Yeah, it's fine. I'll, I'll just play it on my screen. But Okay, I am going to dip out and do homework now. I just wanted to tell you how to do that. Yeah, sure. All right, and, All right let's just get a confirmation that we can see the video. Um, no, yeah, we can. But uh, They can see it? Yeah. All right, cool. Scheduling issues. There was a lot of issues, and it's canceled. So the reason that, just to respond to this, the reason the debate didn't happen on Mike's channel did involve scheduling issues. Uh, the reason my discussion with Dr. Ornish did not happen was not because of the scheduling issue. Um, the reason, I'll just say it right now, was because Dr. Ornish did not like the fact that I put up the debunk on Richard's channel. And he proceeded to write a whole email and blind carbon copy uh, Danielle's colleagues on it. So yeah. that he, was he the was reason. He was personally offended by it. So 
just to clear that out of the way. Canceled. And all that's not that important. What's important to me is where I am in terms of the official proposition, which is a plant-based diet has been clinically shown to reverse heart disease. What are my current thoughts on this? What have we learned? So I want to basically state my position and the research that I believe supports it. For those who are a little lost, we had an epic debate set up where we were going to have Dr. Dean Ornish and Dr. Esselstyn on one side debating for reversal against the younger doctors, Dr. Avi and cardiologist Danielle Bellardo, and is going to be moderated by the former president of the American College of Cardiology, Dr. Kim Williams. I was just going to do technical stuff. And to keep things clear, the young doctors, let's just call them the anti-reversal party. Okay, let's just get the, the branding clear here. Um, anti-reversal. Like, I, I was clear for the branding before. We're the beyond reversal crowd, okay? We're not the anti-reversal crowd. We hope that it will be shown that this reverses heart disease. Yeah. For now, we're calling ourselves the beyond reversal crowd because number one, we don't actually lie to our patients. We don't give them false claims. Number two, we focus on what actually matters, not the reversal, but rather whether you're going to live longer, whether you're going to have another heart attack, et cetera. And are um, not anti you're, um, you're like agnostic, basically. Like if some new evidence came out, you'd be fine with accepting, you know, you're wrong, That's, you can't. Yeah. yeah, so it's kind totally of a mischaracterization. Fine. Yeah, I'm not taking the con, again, I'm not taking the con position. I'm just saying it hasn't been shown. That's all. We don't have the evidence to make the claim. Certainly. My plant-based diet, there begins as far as I know, and they just think that there isn't enough evidence to show for sure that there's reversal. They are still in support of a vegan diet, plant-based diet for the- Yeah, but that, that doesn't make us anti-reversal anyway. Is. We all agree that it lowers mortality in events, so if any low carbers want to spin this, you're just dishonest. All right, moving on. Agreed. Moving on. <laughs> to sum up the anti-reversal camp, they just think that angiograms aren't good enough and that we need newer imaging to show for sure that there's reversal. And I'm going to address... Need, need better imaging to infer that there is a change in plaque volume, specifically. Angiogram validity in this video, but I think that's a fair representation of their position. Moving on. So a few weeks back, I went on a live discussion with the young doctors, and I have no problem admitting that I was unable to put forward good enough evidence that we have reversal based off the standard that they put forward, which was a quote from a study saying that regression is greater than 10% absolute stenosis regression. And st Okay, so not, so let's just go back because that's, what it is regression and stenosis is a quote from a study saying so what it is what the standard that we provided was not just 10 percent stenosis it's a conjunction it's 10 percent change in 10 percent stenosis or more and an improvement of 0.2 millimeters minimal luminal diameter or more so both of those things not just one you'll see this thing that mike does in the video and i want you to be sensitive to it where he will say, oh, the standard, he'll just take one part of the standard out and treat it as an or, and just say, oh, this was met, or that part was met. The standard is not 10%. The standard is not 0.2 millimeter. The standard is a conjunction of both 10% or greater, or point, and, sorry, and 0.2 millimeter or greater. Okay? Just so everyone's clear about that. Saying that regression is greater than 10% absolute stenosis regression and stenosis of course is that plaque lesion and that was in less than two years also including a 0.2 millimeter or greater in the trial was from baseline to two years this is a para this is a comment in parentheses just to give the reader information that it's from baseline to two years it's not saying that it needs to be in less than two years but anyway we'll get into that too increase in minimal luminal diameter which is the shortest point between the inner walls of your arteries at that stenosis point so i can see to that point but i think i also said i personally believe that a vegan or generally plant-based diet reverses heart disease just based off other things. But I was like, yeah, I probably need to revisit this claim. But then over the next few days and week or so, I started realizing that I did not feel good about believing something that I was not able to show. And that just kind of ate. That's still the case. <laughs> kind of ate yeah. me up inside. In that discussion, I presented a larger view of what heart disease and heart disease reversal is. And in good faith, I allowed that to be shot down because you have a cardiologist saying, you're wrong. You know, I was like, fine, I'm wrong. But after looking, it's not just the cardiologist, by the way. I, I would put my bank account on the consensus of interventional cardiologists for this. 
Looking at the data more and more, looking at various studies, looking at various aspects of heart disease, I have flipped my position back. I do believe that we've clinically shown heart disease reversal with a plant-based diet, so they're going to be really disappointed with me anyway. Moving on. To their I'm not disappointed. Here's the thing. I'm not disappointed in Mike because he's changed his view back to his original view. All right, Mike, I'm not. That's not why I'm disappointed with you because you disagree. I'm disappointed that any of these you have an open line to me and any of the arguments you put forth, which are hilarious fails. I'm just going to say it. It's just a failure on monumental levels, both empirically and logically. You could have ran it by me. You could have reached out to me instead of misrepresenting my position and the evidence. That's why I'm disappointed. And to top it off, you won't interact with me. So that's why I'm disappointed. Not because you changed your view. You can change your view. That's fine. You can change your view back and forth as many times as you want, if you have good reason to. Anyway. To their credit, I think it's a great challenge, just general plant-based or vegan notions. And I have learned a lot, and I definitely am going to approach the way that I talk about reversing heart disease differently. For example, that certain people might take heart disease reversal to mean absolutely ditch all modern medicine, go off all medication. As is the number one comment on your YouTube video that you that this video is as the number one comment saying, "Hey, didn't even fill the script for statins." Vacation and refuse all surgery, which is very clearly not going to lead to your highest chance of survival. But at the same time, in terms of the truth of the human body and in terms of what you're recommending people to do, if we have a Venn diagram saying a plant-based diet reverses heart disease and ditch all Western medicine, go off statins and go off everything. These are not the same statement. They don't. They're not the same statement, but one statement can lead to and foster the other statement from materializing. Overlap. I personally think that moving forward in the plant-based movement, there's room for both of those statements together. I don't see why not. Anyway, let's get into my general philosophy on this. You know, I personally follow what could be described as a comprehensive definition of heart disease reversal. Let's pay attention to see if we actually get a definition of what constitutes heart disease reversal from Mike. Let's see if we have a way of adjudicating whether a heart disease reversal has occurred versus it has not occurred. All right. Reversal that goes beyond just stenosis size. We're talking a multifactorial disease, which is what heart disease is, which includes not just volume of stenosis, but also the morphology and the stability. We're talking endothelial function, inflammation, you know, blood flow and heart power and outcomes in terms of death and event rates. I think most would agree that the reversal ability of an intervention would not just be based on a single metric. It would be based on the entire bulk of the literature. And Okay, so look. Many things. So number one, um, I'll actually sc screen share for this point because we can start off with the slide deck. Okay. So let me screen share this. All righty. So comprehensive definition of heart disease reversal. Heart disease is more than just stenosis volume. It's a multifactorial disease, including stenosis, stability, and morphology, endothelial function, blood flow, and heart power, inflammation, event and death rate, and more. The determination of the ability of an intervention should therefore not be based on a single metric, but an overall picture of the scientific literature. Example, a new drug reverses plaque, but destabilizes and leads to more heart, disease, heart attacks. It does not reverse heart disease. Okay, so you need to be very specific about what you're talking about. So there... You can do this with any category. Let's say there's different types of foot disease, for example. And one therapy can reverse a plantar wart, which is a type of foot disease. Um, but it would be very, everyone would recognize that although technically true, it's incredibly misleading to just say this intervention reverses foot disease because there are a million and a half other foot diseases that it's not going to reverse. You could broaden the category to disease in general. Vitamin C reverses disease. That's true, technically, because there is a disease that vitamin C reverses. Okay, scurvy. Vitamin C reverses scurvy. Scurvy is a disease. Hey, it's technically true that vitamin C reverses disease. Fine, but that is incredibly deceptive and dishonest. You, what you should do instead of trying to make this nebulous cloud of all different things that are, that are technically falling under the category of heart disease, you could have done this easier if you wanted to do that. You could have just said, Hypertension, technically speaking, hypertension is a cardiovascular disease. 
and a whole food plant-based diet can reduce blood pressure. So therefore a whole food plant-based diet can reverse cardiovascular disease. Yay. No, you're being very dishonest and deceptive if you do that. You be specific about what you're talking about. Are you talking about atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Are you talking about epicardial atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Are you talking about endothelial function? Are you talking about myocardial ischemia? Are you talking about ejection fraction? Uh, are you, what exactly are you talking about? Um, and by the way, it's very clear what Ornish and Esselstein were talking about. So just in case we're, we're just in case there's any confusion, this is from Ornish's website, what he means when he talks about heart disease. Here's the quote. You can reverse heart disease with the Ornish Lifestyle Medicine Program. The reversal is measured in two ways. We showed both plaque regression at one year and more at five years and increased blood flow of 300 to 400%. Okay. So just in case it wasn't obvious what we're talking about, we're talking, when he says heart disease reversal, he's talking about plaque regression and increased blood flow. All right. Now I'll just give you some accepted standard definitions when we talk, because the paper is not even also talking about heart disease. The Ornish paper talks about coronary heart disease. That's the title of the paper. Coronary artery disease, coronary heart disease, ischemic heart disease. The standard definition is a type of heart disease that develops when the arteries of the heart cannot deliver enough oxygen-rich blood to the heart. This is often caused by buildup of plaque. Here's the link for that. ASCAD, the disease is characterized by a buildup or persistence of plaque in the coronary arteries. Reversal, a change to an opposite direction, position, or course of action. To claim reversal of these things, you have to show at minimum that there is, in fact, an improvement in the diseased arteries such that the ability to develop blood to the heart is improved in virtue of a given lifestyle or diet intervention. In order to claim reversal of ASCAD, one must show at minimum that there is, in fact, a regression of plaque in the coronary arteries in virtue of a given lifestyle or diet intervention. Just so we're clear, that, cl that claim was made, okay? He claimed we showed plaque regression, both plaque regression and increased blood flow. All right, that's what I'm responding to. Okay, let's continue. And various aspects of the disease. I mean, if you're going to assemble the best panel of experts to decide whether or not a diet or intervention reverses heart disease, no, they're going to be looking at all of the evidence. And while we're talking about authorities, I just need to mention that Ornish's program is Ornish's program for the reversal of heart disease, which has been either endorsed directly or accepted. The reversal part has been accepted by some pre- No, 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 no. This is, this is just flat out false. No one, very few, if any, cardiologists, and especially interventional cardiologists, just take, affirm the view that Ornish is reversing heart disease. Um, and we'll go into the misleading statements here. By some pretty major medical authorities. Real quick, we're talking The Lancet, where his work has been published, number two. Publishing in The Lancet doesn't mean that The Lancet takes the view that you can reverse heart disease. Journals publish contrasting views all the time. And even if they did agree with it, it's been 30 years since that was published in The Lancet. And it doesn't mean that the current Lancet agrees with it. Um, you, anyway. To medical journal with reverse in the... Like, this is just not how research works. I published in papers. The fact that a paper publishes your, your work doesn't mean it endorses all the claims that you're making. Yeah, um, he's, he's yeah. literally arguing, well, it's written down there, so it must be true. <laughs> No, that no, but that's but that, that's actually that's well, that's a second problem. The second problem is it's an appeal to authority. But even even at the level of an appeal to authority, there's a further problem, which it's not even the appeal to authority doesn't even go through because it doesn't follow that the Lancet actually a, agrees with this statement. Yeah, because certainly. just because they published it. So number one, it's an appeal to authority. Number two, it doesn't even go through as an appeal to authority. The title, right. also the National Heart, Blood, and Lung Institute of the NIH funded the study. Funding a study doesn't mean the sponsor agrees with the statements you're making. You can have the sponsor, uh, like, oh God. Um, okay, look, okay, I don't want to get too hyped up here. I do want to, all right. So, look, when you apply for a grant or when you get funding from a program, it doesn't mean that they agree with what you're trying to show. 
they can disagree with you and fund you. Uh, they can think that what you're going to show pan doesn't pan out and they can fund you. They can think it will pan out on you. They can be a, a, ambivalent and fund you just because they think the work is interesting. And I would be shocked if... And it's an appeal to authority. They didn't know that the title said reversing heart disease in it. And if they really cared, I think they would probably have a correction there. No, not necessarily at all. You can have all sorts of titles and they don't have to push for a correction. Um, also, your title, the title of your paper doesn't have to be the title of your, uh, of what the grant goes for. Like when you, when you submit a grant, the title doesn't have to be the title of the paper that you finally publish. They didn't, it doesn't even follow that they would have to have to see that title. And even if they did, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't have funded it if they didn't uh, agree with it. Ornish's program with reversal of heart disease in the name is paid for by Medicare. Medicare calls it reversal themselves. No, they don't. So Ornish's program is covered by Medicare. That doesn't mean Medicare calls it reversal. Let's actually take a look at Let's actually take a look at the appeals to authority here. So sharing my Discord. Um, so this is the criteria that needs to be met in order to meet coverage for a program. According to the CMS, as required uh, to be approved for Medicare ICR program, a program must demonstrate through peer-reviewed published research that it has accomplished one or more of the following for its patients. Number one positively affected the progression of coronary heart disease. Notice how it doesn't say reverse or regress, okay? If you slow down the progression or if you halt the progression, you meet one of those three criteria that you need to meet. Number two, reduce the need for coronary bypass surgery. Even if you just do that, you meet the, one of the three criteria that you need to meet. And three, reduce the need for PCI, percutaneous coronary interventions. That's that's the one that was um, statistically significant, although uh, in the or Ornish paper. So he met he met criteria number three, um, but uh, there I don't want to go too much into that uh, whether because of confidence intervals and p values. But anyway, there's also five or more other criteria that you need to meet. Uh, you need to um, okay, so five or more of the following measures for patients from their levels before cardiac rehabilitation services to after cardiac rehabilitation services, accomplishing a statistically significant reduction in the following, one, five of the following. Low LDL, triglycerides, BMI, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, the need for cholesterol, blood pressure, and diabetes medications. Notice how none of these criteria say reversal of heart disease. And if you go, I have a CMS link for this letter, this decision memo, and nowhere in the memo does it say that any acknowledgement that Ornish has reversed heart disease, that his program reverses heart disease. He just met the criteria, none of which, none of which involved reversal of heart disease or entail reversal of heart disease. So to say Medicare calls it reversal is not true. It's just false. And it's an appeal to authority. So again, the same two problems. Number one, it's appeal to authority. Number two, it fails as an appeal to authority because it's not, it doesn't even go through as a fallacy. It doesn't even get to the level of being a fallacy. Finally, in the Harvard Heart Letter, you can see it explicitly stated that, that heart disease reversal is possible in the context of Ornish's program. The, heart, the Harvard Letter is a newsletter. So yes, you found a newsletter where someone says that you can reverse heart disease in the context of Ornish's program. I can give you interventional cardiologists from Harvard who will say that that's nonsense. And I'm willing to put in my bank that the consensus of interventional cardiologists will say that will, will cringe at that. So what? Your, your, my appeal to authority is bigger than your appeal to authority. Like, no, let's just focus on the data and what valid inferences we can make. And you're probably thinking that like an appeal to authority. And to that, I have to say, absolutely, because this is the level that we're at. We're at the level where he will mention the name of a fallacy and proudly commit the fallacy. Because the reversal definition that we ultimately decide on is going to be subjective. So you're either going to go with an authority or... Notice, by the way, how none of those um, statements that he brought in terms of those authorities were actual definitions of reversal of heart disease. Or just go with your personal belief. You now we're stuck with that. And it's not just a bunch of vegan, ethically motivated doctors using this reversal terminology. It's some pretty major medical authorities. But back to... Like who? Aside from... 
I mean, I, by the way, I just want to say even the, I'm not going to say which cardiologist it is or which cardiologists rather, but the, the cardiologists that Mike ends up citing in this video, some of them, I'm not going to say which ones, cause I don't want them to get into a whole battle with Ornish have came to me and have told me that after they've seen the things that I've said, they actually are convinced and they don't want to use the word reversal anymore. So, and, and medical doctors as well. I'm not going to say who it is because I know Ornish has a reputation of not playing uh, nice. Um, what someone told me that I'm not making that claim. So don't sue me for defamation. Um, but yeah, I mean, so we'll just. Stenosis for a simple and kind of mediocre analogy. It's like asking whether or not automobile deterioration can be reversed, but then you only look at the odometer. I mean. And if you thought comparing a plaque to a pimple was bad, Here's a car. So again, like my response to this is just like, I provided the standard definitions. Mike still has yet to provide a standard definition here or any definition for that matter. I don't know how to adjudicate the difference between heart disease, what has reversed heart disease or not reversed heart disease. And again, if you want to say there are many different types of heart diseases, that's fine, but be specific about what you're talking about. Don't look for some nebulous cloud to say, oh, you know, just like with the foot example, like we wouldn't say that this reverses foot disease because it just reverses a plantar wart. All right, let's- I mean, there's clearly with that, if we only had one metric to look at, if we could only look at stenosis, then yeah, that's as limited as our view is, but we have so much more. The reason we were focusing on stenosis is not because we can't look at all the other things and we will look at all the other things and how they don't pan out either, don't worry. The reason we were focusing on stenosis is because we were attacking a very specific claim, a claim that was made by Ornish and Esselstyn, which is you can regress plaque, all right? And a simple example of why stenosis isn't everything, imagine there's a new drug on the market and it rapidly reduces stenosis volume. It just 10% a week gone, but it destabilizes so rapidly that it increases heart attack rate and death rate by like 20 times. Then we, then we would say it reverses plaque. It regresses plaque. Clearly it does, but it's not worth taking because it increases your rate of death. We would be specific. We wouldn't just say it reverses heart disease. We would say, technically speaking, it is true that it reverses plaque. You can't argue with that. Um, but it could still not be worth taking if it destabilizes that and form, heart, and form uh, for future MIs. Clearly it is not reversing heart disease. Actually, clearly it is depending on what specific heart disease you're talking about. If you're talking about atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, um, as measured by, as defined, is just analytically entailed by the persistence of plaque or buildup of plaque. By definition, it reverses it. It's just okay to also say, we're still not gonna do it because it causes other problems, namely other types of heart diseases like MIs. Right. Stenosis alone can never tell you either way, so we have to look at the whole picture. All right, here's a snapshot of the comprehensive view. We're going to go through all of these claims. Okay, we're going to go through regression of stenosis. We're going to go through lower uh, CAD events, lower angina, lower inflammation, increased heart blood flow, improved endothelial function. None of these pan out to show reversal. Of heart disease reversal I'm talking about doesn't include everything, just for simplicity's sake. You have that regression, which I will defend in a bit. You have those lower CAD rates, lowered by 60% in the Orna study. Esselstyn's rate was lower. That was possibly due to higher adherence, possibly due to some statin usage as well, but not randomized controlled trials, so I'll just leave it out for now. Now we have lower angina or chest pain episodes by 91%. We see lower inflammation level in people with heart disease by about 30% pretty quickly. Big part of the picture we see that increased blood flow in the heart and we see improved endothelial function by several metrics and here's a 2017 paper that really sums up the comprehensive reversal idea in the journal of the american college of cardiology written by drs ornish and dr kim williams who i know the anti-reversal party respects as well as others Talking about Ornish's studies, they say significant reversal in coronary heart disease as measured by improvements in ventricular function using radionuclide ventriculography, a 400% increase in heart blood flow using PET scans, regression in coronary atherosclerosis using quantitative coronary angiography, and two and a half times fewer cardiac events when compared with randomized control. Okay, so let's respond to that. So here we are. So couple of different lines of evidence are being presented. Um, so first one was radio, uh, radionuclide ventriculography. So radionuclide ventriculography is a way of measuring ejection fraction. Um, 
Ejection fraction is the fraction of blood that the heart can expel um, when it contracts. And it's a measure, uh, it's a useful measure in things like heart failure. Uh, when ejection fraction, when someone has heart failure, they have a decreased ejection fraction. When, uh, if you reverse the heart failure, you, the, the ejection fraction it can increase. Um, but there are other ways to increase ejection fraction other than reversal of cardiac disease. We'll go over that. So the issue is Ornish's asse um, assessment of his intervention effect using radionuclide ventriculography underdetermines reversal of CHD for several reasons. So number one, despite being labeled as a non-aerobic exercise, stretching and breathing exercises like yoga, even though it's not considered aerobic exercises, have been shown to improve ejection fraction by a similar and in some cases greater amounts than Ornish's results. Whether a plant-based diet contributed to the improvement in ejection fraction remains to be shown. And I have three different papers that you can, that you can uh, follow along with on the Discord. But essentially the problem is, for problem number one, is that the Ornish intervention included a form of exercise that has been shown to increase ejection fraction. Um, and so simply pointing out an increased ejection fraction on radionuclide ventriculography doesn't mean it's from the diet, especially since the uh, exercise increases ejection fraction by similar, if not greater amounts. And number two, even if the intervention itself underdetermines reversal of CHD, um, as EF may simply, uh, under, sorry, even the intervention itself underdetermines reversal of CHD, as EF may simply be increased by physiologic hypertrophy of non disease myocardium. So, for example, if you exercise, your heart undergoes physiologic hypertrophy. That in and of itself can increase your ejection fraction if your heart is diseased, even though the entire segment of your diseased heart doesn't get undiseased. So even the, that intervention underdetermines what we would consider reversal. And if you just want to consider by any means, even if there's no uh, reversal of the disease segment of the heart reversal, then it's just underdetermined by the multifactorial intervention of exercise, which has been shown to have equivalent, if not better, results in the EF that Ornish has shown. All right, let's keep, oh, and just to continue responding, because it's not just ventriculography, it's MPI, myocardial perfusion imaging. So Ornish did a trial that had three endpoints and looked at blood flow as inferenced uh, by myocardial perfusion imaging. There were three endpoints. Uh, first one is a uh, lowest quadrant average, which was the average number of normalized counts for the quadrant having the lowest average activity, which was an anterior, septal, lateral, and inferior quadrant surrounding a central apex area. The mean value for any given quadrant with the lowest or minimal activity was the quadrant that contains the most severe perfusion defect. This lowest quadrant average was determined for the PET image at rest and after dipyridamol stress. Uh, dipyridamol stress is a vasodilator, so this uh, it's a, it's a pharmacological stress test, you stress the heart. There are two ways to do a stress test. You can do it as an exercise treadmill, or you can give a patient a pharmacological agent that induces stress. In this case, they use the pharmacological agent. This endpoint quantified the relative severity of perfusion abnormality. For example, a value of 65 would indicate that the mean count value for the quadrant with the lowest counts and therefore containing the perfusion deficit defect would be 65 compared to the maximum 100%. Okay, so let's just wrap our head around this first endpoint. So let's say you have a heart and you have different quadrants of the heart, fine. You have a, you have a given amount of activity relative to your maximum activity. So your normal maximum is going to be standardized as 100. Uh, so th th there's a certain amount of tracer uptake based on flow to the heart, and we can standardize the highest amount as the normal maximum is 100%. Now, relative to that 100%, not all of the heart is going to have that same amount of blood flow. So not all of the heart is going to have the same amount of uh, tracer that gets taken up. So it can go down to 70%. Relative to the 100% maximum, it can go down to 80%. It can go down to 65%. Fine. That's a relative metric. It's not standardized to any normal and healthy individual. It's a relative metric to the, to the patients themselves. Second endpoint, percentage outside 2.5 standard deviations was the size of the perfusion defect determined as the percentage of 
cardiac image outside of 2.5 standard deviations of that of normal uh, normal individuals based on 20 disease-free persons for the PET image at rest or after diperitoneal stress because 2.5 standard deviations includes 97.6% of the normal distribution, there was only a 2.4% chance that normal values outside the 2.5 standard deviations we observed. Okay, so second endpoint. This is not a relative metric. This is an absolute metric because it's standardizing it to normal disease-free individuals. So how low you are, what percentage of your myocardium is outside the 2.5 standard deviations of normal individuals? Three, third endpoint, percentage with a ratio of less than 0.6 was a measure of the combined severity and size of perfusion abnormalities determined as a percentage of myocardium with activity of less than 60% of maximum activity, or 100%, on the PET image. This measurement gives the size of the defect characterized by the severity of threshold of less than 60% of the normal maximum of 100%, and therefore reflects the combined intensity and size of the defect on PET image. A value of less than 0.6 or less than uh, 60% of the maximum PET image is approximately three standard deviations below the normal mean of 80% plus minus 10% of the maximum activity. Because three standard deviations contain 99.7% of the normal distribution, there was less than 0.3% chance that normal values would be observed below 60% of maximum activity. Okay, so another metric that can be standardized to normal individuals. Fine. This, These were the results. I don't know if you can how well you guys can see this. Um, I can open the original and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if can you well wait? Can you link it uh, maybe in? Uh, sure, sure. In I can link it to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Here's the paper. Okay, here we are. And where should I go down to? Uh, figure two. Changes okay. in severity of myocardial perfusion abnormalities by positron emission tomography. Figure two. Okay, so wait. I see figure one. Okay, figure one is top left. Where's figure two? It's on uh, page three, right? Um, I can open it. Uh, do you see where it shows those bars? Um, lowest quadrant average. Percent left in, uh, LD outside 2.5 standard deviations, percent LD with its activity. Um, actually, let me just open this. Fine. Okay, so figure, oh, I'll show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on the page that's labeled, oh, well, it's actually, I probably should just share my screen then. Um, let me see. Let me share my screen. Here we go. All right, can you see it? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. So here were the endpoints. Now, as you can see, the control group did get worse. This, so this is the relative metric. Uh, the control group got worse. That, that means, well, when I say worse, since it's a relative metric, it's just the, the variance between your normal maximum and your, um, and your, um, and your threshold for what you're considering your, your lowest quadrant average uh, increase. So there's an increase in the range of that metric. Um, and if it's an increase, it's considered worse. If a decrease, it's considered better. Uh, percent left of uh, LV out, left ventricle outside 2.5 standard deviations. Same story. So if it's if that's a higher value, it's worse. If it's a lower value, it's better. Experimental group got better, control group got worse, statistically significant compared to each other. Same story with the third metric. Experimental group got better, control group got worse, statistically significantly different from each other. Does this mean we can claim reversal based on improvement of blood flow? It actually does not. Does this mean we can claim that you're better off than you would have been otherwise? Yes, it does. Uh, because compared to the control, it's statistically significant, but that doesn't tell us if it's statistically significant compared to where you are when you started. That's very hard for a parallel design study to to to, to answer. And I'll just like I want to. This is a huge issue, and I want everyone to get their heads around this because a lot of papers claim regression of plaque or reversal of disease, and they do a parallel design uh, trial. And here's the problem with that. So 
when you look at an endpoint and you determine that there is a statistically significant difference between the experimental group and the control group, the question you're answering there is, are you better off the, or are, are things meaningfully, can you be X amount confident, assuming all the models are, the assumptions in the models are, are there, that you that there the uh, there's a statistically significant difference between the, the experimental group and the control group control group the point of the control group control group is what would have happened otherwise are you better off than what would have happened otherwise the answer that is not being the, the question that's not being answered is are you better off than you started okay that's a very different different okay. answer different question so for example let's say i know they got better by like in this metric uh 5.1 Let's just hypothetically say, just to illustrate the point, let's say the experimental group got better by 0 0.001, right? And the control group got worse by 10.3. And it just turned out that it was statistically significant, OK? Does that mean the experimental group reversed their disease? No. What do you think, Richard? No, no probably it not. Just, yeah. Yeah, it's it's statistically significant because there's a certain distance when you consider the variance and the point estimates between the experimental group and control group. That just tell in this case, if in this hypothetical, it would just mean that the control group got worse and the experimental group didn't get worse. And that's what's statistically significant. What it's not telling you is is there a statistically significant difference between where the experimental group started off with and where the experimental group ended up? Do you appreciate that difference? Yeah, absolutely. Now, there is a way to the most. So I spoke to a statistician about this. And the most accurate way of assessing it, if you really do want to claim this reversal claim, is not to do a parallel design trial. It's to do a crossover trial. A crossover trial is a repeated measures uh, trial where everyone uh, serves as their own control and they're exposed to different conditions. Now, no, I'll just tell. I'll just skip to the end. None of the trials claiming reversal were parallel design. But that being said, sorry, they were not crossover design. But that being said, there may be some weaker way of inferring reversal if, in a, in a parallel design trial, if you meet the following criteria. So, number one, you want to be able to show that there's a statistically significant difference between the experimental group and the control group. That makes sense, right? You want to know that you are better off than you would have been otherwise. We're on board with that. Number two, you also want to show that there is a statistically significant difference between the ex where the experimental group started off with and where they ended up. So that is to say that you don't want the statistically significant difference to just be the result of the control group getting worse you want to show that you statistically significantly got better if you want to claim reversal. Are you appreciating that? Yep. Yeah, that's pretty easy to follow. Okay, cool. So we meet both. Of, so the question is, did any of these endpoints meet both of those criteria? And I'll just skip to the end. The answer is no. So we'll just show that. I'll share my screen. So in the Ornish study, uh, they in this myocardial perfusion study, they used a one-tailed uh, un, uh, unpaired t-test. Now, I'll just ignore the one-tailed issue. I have issues with the one-tailed test. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to nitpick on it. Technically, also, you're not supposed to, when you're looking at tr comparing treatment effects, you're not just supposed to use a uh, unpaired t-test, but whatever, the authors used an unpaired t-test for this purpose, fine, I'll let it go. But for consistency's sake, I'll just perform, I performed the t-test uh, for the experimental group baseline to follow up for all of these metrics, one, two-tailed and one-tailed. And here they are, none of them are statistically significant for any of these endpoints. So yes, they were able to show that there was a statistically significant improved blood flow in the experimental group compared to the control group, yes. What was not shown in any of these metrics, even on a one-tailed t-test, was that there's a statistically significant improvement 
in the experimental group. Okay, so at best we can say that it prevents things from getting worse. We can't claim it reverses the disease. It's not statistically significantly shown to improve where you end up from, compared to where you started off. I also did this with RevMan, Roots Review Manager. For those who are in my Discord, you can follow along with all of these, um, with all of the statistical tests that I performed. Nothing, no metric here is statistical, statistically significant, whether it's a mean difference model or a standard mean difference model. I'll also note that from the paper, that the analysis that includes patients with total coronary artery occlusions at entry, the standard deviations are actually incorrectly reported in this paper. Uh, the values are reported are not standard deviations, that's mentioned in table two, but they're actually standard errors of the mean. This is evident by the fact that the point estimates and ranges are the exact same numbers to the control group as pre previously reported as standard error of the mean. So I'll just show what that what that is. So let me share my screen. This is like a minor error where I'm not picking too hard on this, but like this, this is an error in the paper, so I'll just show it. Okay. Okay, so this table is the same three endpoints, but these this table included patients with total coronary artery occlusions at entry, okay? That's why the point estimates and um, standard error, standard reported standard deviations is actually standard errors of mean are different because it's apparent that everyone with a total coronary artery occlusion went into the experimental group. How do I know that? Because the point estimates and variant and reported standard devi standard error of the means are exactly the same. So if you look at these numbers, they're the same as these numbers in each control group. Okay. Now they say that they're the standard error of the mean, right? They say that in the abstract. They say that in the. They say that in the uh, endpoints. But over here, you have literally the same numbers, and they report it as mean plus minus standard deviation. This is an error. It's not plus minus standard deviation. It's plus minus standard error of the mean. They can't be the same. Um, it's they're going to be different by the square root of the sample size. Anyway, um, not whatever. That's fine. We I in my test I corrected for that, um, and I ran the same statistical test. Nothing was statistically significantly different from the experimental baseline follow-up, and I'll just show that here. So let me turn my screen. So here are the tests I performed, um, whether it's a fixed 90% confidence interval, by the way, I was using, I was being very generous. Okay. I, I wasn't using 95% confidence intervals. I was using 90% confidence intervals just to be de generous, that whole, to be more consistent with a one tail T test that the authors decided to use. Still no endpoints were statistically significantly different from experimental baseline follow-up. Figure five, this is a really hilarious figure. Um, Hold on one moment, let me. So they found a way to average everything together into one amalgamation. Um, percentage of patients with significant changes greater than the threshold change as defined below in size and severity of myocardial perfusion abnormalities by PET after dipermitoral stress. Significant change in each of the three PET measurements of size and severity of perfusion abnormalities was defined as a change in each PET measurement of the final PET study that was greater than one standard deviation of each of the PET measurements. Notice when they say significant, they're not talking about statistical significance. It's just how they're defining it. Um, so basically what they're doing here is they're averaging the three of these endpoints. They're averaging the relative metrics with the absolute metrics. I have no idea how to even go about performing some sort of test to see if there's a statistically significant difference there from from baseline to follow up. How I would even do that, um, I have no idea how valuable this is. Um, your average around a relative uh, endpoint with absolute endpoints, um, and I don't even know if this is something that's okay to do, um, because, or if this artificially uh, decreases variance or whatnot. I, I don't even know what it means. Um, but regardless, if someone want, if there's a statistician that thinks they can uh, perform such an average like this, 
Um, because here's the thing, the, the problem with, I can't just meta analytically summate these endpoints because they're not independent of each other. They're all, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna be related to each other. They're not independent variables. And so I'm just gonna artificially decrease the variance if I do that. And you can have a spurious statistically significant result from experimental baseline to follow up. So I don't know what way to do that um, to actually even answer the question for this or how meaningful this is at all if it uh, concludes reversal. Anyway, we can, we can continue. So that's the response to my, okay. So we responded to the radionuclide ventriculography. We responded to the myocard fusion. So just to wrap, just to go over it, the ejection fraction underdetermines reversal because the Ornish program included an, a type of exercise that has been shown to increase ejection fraction by the same amount, if not more. The myocardial perfusion studies, the blood flow studies, they show a statistically significant Im uh, improvement relative to the control, but they do not show at any endpoint a statistically significant improvement relative to where you started off with. At best, you can say that you're better off than you would have otherwise been. Things didn't get worse, but you can't say that there is reversal. It did not show a statistically significant improvement. Okay, we're going to deal with the rest. We're going to deal with the reduction in event rate. Um, now, just real quick, someone might say, oh, maybe that's just because it wasn't powered enough. Fine, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. The only way to tell if it's because it wasn't powered enough is to just do a larger study. Sorry. Let's keep going. With that in mind, it's pretty clear why I reject the propositions in their syllogism, which is a layout of their logical argument based on their minimization of heart disease in general. But I particularly reject the 0.4 millimeter minimal. If you reject a premise, or a prop in this case, if you reject a proposition, I, it's actually entailed, you're zooming in on the premises. Um, if you reject a premise in the argument, you need to address the supporting arguments. There are valid there are logically valid supporting arguments for each premise. You haven't addressed that. Minimal luminal diameter cutoff, which the whole argument hinges on, and I will cover that in detail later, as well as the validity of angiograms in a bit. But first, to the hill that I died on a few weeks back, the 10% regression quote. It seems that the anti-reversal party has abandoned this anyway, but I... We have not abandoned this, okay? You can... All right, this may be... Look. You can have multiple arguments against one position. You can say, okay, here's an argument against a position. Also, here's a stronger argument against the position, right? Just because you move to another argument that's a stronger argument doesn't mean you've abandoned the prior argument. You can say that, hey, look, there are many arguments against this position and it fails on many different levels. Just because we've added another argument against the view doesn't mean we've abandoned the prior argument need to address it. Again, we're talking greater than 10% absolute stenosis regression in less than two years. We're talking about 10, again, we're talking about the conjunction of 10% sten of greater stenosis and 0.2 minimum luminal diameter, not one or the other. There's with that opening up of the arteries of 0.2 millimeters or greater of the inner lumen. Now, the study we all had our eyes on in the discussion was Ornish's Lancet paper, the most recent one. And no, it didn't break that 10% threshold. It also just didn't mention what percent of the people broke the 10% threshold. However, it became clear to me later that there is a study a few years back. Now, this is the same lifestyle heart trial just earlier, but it looks at some different things and was published in the American Journal of Cardiology. In this study, they found that greater than 10% diameter stenosis regression was broken in 41% of subjects. All of Okay, so this is not true. And we're going to go over why that's not true. Um, okay. So uh, let's go to threshold not met. Okay, here we go. Okay, so Mike well, wants to say a few things. The screen, by the way. Oh, yeah, 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 let me show this. Yeah, actually, let's play the rest of the, we'll go through why that's All of the let's angiograms were this. done within less than a two-year period as well. I think that's an arbitrary time mark, but whatever, they did it. Well, milder stenoses didn't have much of a minimal luminal diameter increase. Severe stenoses averaged a 0.17 millimeter increase, which means half of them were over 0.17. Okay, um, 
actually we should probably just go one by one let's because uh, there's so Luminal much diameter here. increase okay so the the he mike wants to say that 41 percent actually um did break that threshold so let's go over that and why that's not true for all stenoses so before we do that i just want to point out first and foremost and so i'll share my screen So just to point out, first and foremost, that this is actually, again, not what the threshold is. So the threshold wasn't 10%. It was a conjunction of 10% stenosis and 0.2 millimeters minimal luminal diameter or greater improvement, showing what proportion of people met either one without showing what proportion of people met both criteria is just changing the criteria. Two, regarding the claim that 41% of participants saw a 10% regression of stenosis diameter, this is almost certainly false, and the paper's claim is almost certainly incorrect based on everything we know about statistics, and here's why. Okay. Here is a table, okay? And it shows the treated subjects, and it shows their diameter stenosis. Okay, can everyone see what, what I'm pointing to on yeah, the screen? Yeah, diameter stenosis. that's pretty okay. clear. So they started off with 40.1%, they ended off with 38%. Average difference, 2.1 absolute percentage points, right? Makes sense. Was it statistically, notice how, by the way, over here, they're pointing out both of the things I was talking about. Was the difference statistically significant from baseline to follow-up? Yes. Was it statistically significant based on the difference between experimental control? Yes. So they're actually on board with me for this metric. They're actually reporting both of those differences, if they were statistically significant or not. Just pay attention to that because they stopped reporting it halfway through the paper. Um, so if you're... And I know not everything follows a perfect normal distribution, but if your mean improvement is 2.1%, if that's your mean improvement, what do you think your standard deviation has to be to get 41%? Even if you're just taking this 105 stenoses and you're, aver and you're you know, averaging the stenoses per patient, if you're doing it on a per patient calculation, it's still going to be in insane to have 41% of your patients. What do you think your standard deviation needs to be? So I calculated it, okay? Here is what your standard deviation needs to be in terms of absolute percentage point improvements in order to get 41% to get over 10% stenosis, okay? It needs to be, again, this is a normal distribution. I understand there could be non-normal distributions, but the standard deviation required is just insane. You need to have a standard deviation of 34, around 34.7 absolute percentage points in order to have a mean of 2.1 of improvement and, a, and simultaneously at 41% to meet that threshold. Why is this insane? Because we're not even three standard deviations away from mathematically impossible values. Even if you started off with 100% stenosis, which they didn't, by the way, they started off with around 40% stenosis. Even if you start off with 100% stenosis, we're not even three standard deviations away from 100% improvement or greater, which is mathematically impossible. You can't reduce stenosis by over 100 absolute percentage points. Are you following that, Richard? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And they didn't start off. The average didn't start off at 100%. They started off at around 40%. That's right here. Okay. So we're not. We're uh, just. We're just over one standard deviation for the average of where we even started off with to begin with. So what actually took place here? What's the problem? So we can back calculate the what the. Uh, standard deviation was, it's not going to be perfect due to the difference between paired and unpaired t-tests. But what we can do is notice how that difference, they gave us a p-value for the delta, right? They gave us a p-value of 0 0.03. I can estimate it, and not, I understand for any statistician looking is that I understand the difference between paired and unpaired tests and how RevMan works. But you can get, and I'll, and I'll validate it, I'll show you that the estimation is accurate at the end. But I can actually estimate what the standard deviation actually was for that 2.1 change in percentage to notice. Here it is. So you can plug it into the RevMan calculator. You can plug in the values. You can standardize it 
uh, to the difference. So what difference uh, did the experimental baseline experience relative baseline? By definition, it's zero. Uh, and the standard deviation for that is by definition uh, zero. Uh, and should you just determine treatment effects? Um, so to determine uh, treatment effects, uh, so we have that standardization method and we just put in the treatment, uh, degree of treatment, the numbers for both groups. The, um, the standard deviation is, um, can automatically be calculated from the p-value. You can reverse engineer it and we get a standard deviation of 9.78. Based on that, we would not expect 40% to meet that bar. We would only expect, we would actually only expect around 20% uh, to meet that bar. And by the way, we would actually expect uh, over 10%. Uh, we'd actually expect about 11% of the control group to meet that bar too. So the absolute difference between the control group and the experimental group would actually be less uh, than 10%. That's what we would expect. Is that going to be statistically significantly different? Who knows? So what actually happened here? Why are the authors reporting 40 uh, 1%. So this is the section of the paper, the relevant section. So what they said was statistical analysis of stenosis as opposed to patients was performed because multiple stenosis in the patient showed change essentially independent of each other as previously demonstrated. Statistical analysis weighing for a small degree of within patient correlation of stenosis changed as previously described did not change the significance of these results. Analysis was also performed on a per patient basis by averaging all percent diameter stenosis for each patient. If you look at the paragraph before, I don't have it on screen, but they also mentioned that they were subsectioning stenoses of based on fractional flow, based on stenotic flow reserve. They didn't do FFR. They did SFR based on stenotic flow reserve of less than three or greater. We'll get into stenotic flow reserve. But what they, there were 17 severe lesions as classified by stenotic flow reserve of three or less. And what they did was they averaged those and they mentioned that in a previous paragraph, and then when they say averaging all percent diameter stenosis, they may have just been referring to the severe ones, the 17 instead of out of uh, over 100 stenoses. Now, how do we test that hypothesis? Well, we can do the same thing. We can see this table. This table is for the severe lesions with uh, stenotic flow reserve less than three. There were 17 of them in the uh, experimental group. And you see, this makes a lot more sense because look at this difference. You see, they started off at 66.5% and they ended off at 57.2%, a difference improvement of 9.3. It's act, that looks like it could be promising. That looks like you could realistically get 40% without an insane standard deviation above the 10%. Okay, now let's, let's reverse engineer it. Let's plug in that 0.001 p-value back in. Did the same procedure. Okay, what standard deviation did I get? 9.55. Using the assuming the normal distribution, what did I predict? I predicted that with this with this standard deviation, the mean of 9.3, standard deviation 9.5, that we would expect 47% to go over the 10% threshold. The authors reported 41%. That's an accurate estimate. Okay, that makes more sense. That's likely what happened here. So this approach just looks at a small fraction of stenosis. The paper misinterpreted as uh, all stenosis. Um, this is just another change from the original criteria. Uh, another issue that you should know, all right? At least half of that difference, even in the severely section stenosis, at least half of that difference, again, falls to the same problem of the reference artery getting smaller, all oh, right? So right. if you look at, <laughs> so yes, Stenosis improved by 9.3%. Minimal lumen diameter improved by an average in the severely stenotic segments is 0.17%. If you look at the proximal and distal arteries, I don't care which one you end up using as your reference diameter, but you can actually worse. see them getting, you can actually see them getting worse. Yeah. The reference artery is getting smaller and that's bumping up the percent, uh, the improvement in stenosis, spurious. Yeah, so there wasn't any actual improvement. It was just the reference artery getting smaller. <laughs> it, there was, there was, well, there was some improvement. If I actually, in my spare time, because this is what I do in my spare time, actually said, okay, what if I assumed that that didn't take place? There is still going to be some improvement because it didn't, the minimal diameter improved by 0.17%, but it's not going to be 9.3. It's going to be like 6. Point something. Okay. Um, that's going to be your average. Well, it's going to be a lot less impressive. And, um, yeah, notice another thing. Here's another thing you should notice. Um, 
is this statistically significantly different compared to the control? We actually don't know. I actually, can, I actually can answer this question, but I, I'll answer it for the minimum diameter. I didn't put the work into answer for this one because there's a lot of reverse engineering work that needs to be done. You'll notice notice before that they were reporting this. Look at you see that they were reporting both of these things statistically significantly different from baseline to follow up, and they were also reporting statistically significantly different between the treatment and the control. You see how they're reporting both like they should be? Yeah. Yeah. Now, notice how that this little line over here, whether they report that it's if it's statistically significantly different between treatment and control, suddenly that line just disappears. Okay? If you look over here, yeah, that yeah, line just goes it just it just goes away. Okay? And we're going to calculate, we're actually going to back calculate and we're going to show that actually they're not statistically significantly different. And that may be why they actually drop that part. All right. For at least several of those metrics that were not statistically significantly different from the control. A little shady, but okay. Um, so let's do that. Um, so we're going to do that for the, actually, let's continue the video. Um, here we go. of subjects. All of the angiograms were done within less than a two year period as well. I think that's an arbitrary time mark, but whatever, they did it. Well, milder stenoses didn't have much of a minimal luminal diameter increase, severe stenoses averaged a 0.17 millimeter increase, which means half of them were over 0.17, so a 0.2 millimeter change. Notice how he's just making this bell curve up, by the way. He doesn't know what proportion, he doesn't know the standard deviation. He doesn't know what proportion actually met, met this. He's just speculating what it meant. If your standard deviation, now, I, incidentally, I agree with him. Um, but the reason I agree with him isn't because I uh, made up numbers. Uh, the reason I agree with him is because I actually back checked it. Um, so, but notice how he doesn't know this. And this is actually not accurate. This, the num the purport, it doesn't look like this if you actually back calculate how many met point two. So he's he's just I don't know if he just invented it, um, but yeah I mean technically he didn't say that this is to scale or this is accurate but yeah I mean this for all he knows this could have been all the way down to down to the, the three standard deviation points away he doesn't know this certainly occurred. In terms of the debate motion, not everyone has to have reversal; it just needs to be shown. So a plant based diet has broken this threshold. <laughs> no, okay, so. Let's um, let's go to the minimal lumen diameter increase. Okay. So the minimal luminal diameter increased by 0 0.17. We can see that over here. Notice how, again, that little line showing whether it's statistically significantly different from the experimental group to compare it to the control group is missing. Let's find out if it was statistically significant. So here's what I did. OK. Um, so I plugged the values in, did the same procedure, standardized the treatment effect. OK. And then they gave me a p-value. The p-value they gave me is 0 0.002. Because they gave me that p-value, I can back calculate what the standard deviation changed for the treatment effect for, for, the, uh, for the differences. Great. OK. So the standard deviation for that delta is that. And assuming the same standard deviation for the treatment group, for the treatment delta and the control delta. Now, this is an assumption, but I'm not just going to assume. I'm going to actually calculate it. Assuming the same standard deviation for the treatment group and control group, group, I'll just tell you right now the results would be null. But maybe the standard deviation for the control group was lower, which would make it statistically significant. Now, how low does the standard deviation of the control group need to be in order for it to reach statistical significance between the delta of the control group and the delta of the experimental group. So I manually calculated it to get to a p-value of 0 0.05. And this is what I got. You have to get to the control group had to have a standard deviation of 0 0.0795 or lower in order for there to be a statistically significant difference between the delta of the experimental group and delta of the control group. But we already know that the delta, um, but we already know that the delta of the QDA two to one group was not statistically significant. So we have them telling us that the delta QCA two to one that that change 
in the control group in the in the uh, minimal luminal diameter was not statistically significant. So they're telling us that the p-value is greater than 0.05. With that information, we can actually prove it's not statistically significant because if the values were to be 0.0795 or lower, it actually would be statistically significant when you plug it back in. The p-value would be 0.0039. So it must be greater than that standard deviation, which means the results between the control group and the uh, experimental group are actually not statistically significant. And surprise, surprise, they remove the line that tells us if there's a statistically significant difference between the control group and the experimental group. Whoops. Are you following that? Uh, just no, to... yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's a huge, I mean, look, I, we're, I'm not gonna speculate on motives or anything like that, but anyway. Well, that's met this definition for reversal of stenosis. However, there's many problems with this definition. First of all, it's somewhat arbitrary. Second of all, I would like to know what definition is not an arbitrary definition, Mike. All de definitions are social constructs. They're judged by their utility, um, not whether they're arbitrary or not. Show me, unless you want to take some weird linguistic objectivism or prescript linguistic prescriptivism view. Um, no. Definitions are arbitrary, sure. Regression, it never mentions heart disease overall. There's logical issues as well. For example, one way to diagnose heart disease is a 20% or greater absolute stenosis. Because I know cardiologists are watching this, I, I instead of going, for, instead of starting, usually I start going over what the principal problem with what Mike is saying it is. With He says there's a logical problem. He doesn't know the first thing about what he's talking about here. He doesn't know logic. And we'll show that, but because I know cardiologists are going to be watching this, I understand that this is bullshit. I understand that no cardiologist considers 20% stenosis on angiography to be a threshold by which a patient has or does not have a, uh, CAD, okay? If you look at Mike's slide, and I'll share, I'm still sharing my Discord, cool. If you look at um, Mike's slide, he says... Um, 20% absolute stenosis is the threshold for coronary artery disease with respect to artery health, one metric of heart disease. A patient's 9% absolute stenosis reduction from the 18 to 19% would be the reversal and elimination of heart disease. The 10% definition fails to include this objective reversal of disease and is therefore invalid. So before I go over what Mike is, what logical non-problem Mike is trying to illustrate here, I will just really quickly just say to any cardiologist watching, I know this is not true. I know you don't actually think 20% absolute stenosis defines whether a patient has CAD or not. Angiography is a luminogram. By the time a patient has 20% stenosis in the, lumi in the luminogram, they have already had CAD to begin with. All right. Um, but let's pretend for the sake of the argument that 20% stenosis really is before I get into that, actually, I'll just mention that Mike misquoted the paper, too, because the paper says no apparent CAD on angiography. No angiographic CAD extent defined by degree. No apparent CAD is the 20% cutoff. It doesn't say that there's no CAD. It says there's no apparent CAD. Everyone understands that CAD was already there when it reaches 10, with 20%. Now, just to illustrate the problem, but let's... Let's pretend that for the sake of the argument, 20% stenosis really is what cardiologists consider to be the threshold for having CAD versus not having CAD. What criticism is Mike trying to suggest here? So I just want, I'll explain it. And I just want, because I want all the layman to understand it, because this is actually a criticism that smart people have fallen for. I don't actually blame Mike for falling for this criticism. So what he's trying to say is, let's say hypothetically, 20% determines whether you have coronary artery disease or not, okay? Now, if you want to say that 10%, 10% stenosis reduction is what defines reversal, or in this case, we're calling it clinically relevant reversal of disease, what can happen is a patient's 9% absolute stenosis can make them go from 28 to 19%. Okay, but that's not going to be reversal, even though they no longer have CAD. Okay, so it is and is not reversal. It's a contradiction. 
right? Or at the very least, it fails to include what we care about. Does that make sense? Okay, no, go over that again. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is this is a tricky part. Like smart people have fallen for this. So 20, so let's say 20% defines whether you have coronary artery disease or not. Okay. So if you are over 20% stenosed, you have coronary artery disease. If you are less than 20% stenosed, you do not have coronary artery disease. Okay? Okay. Now, if we say that someone needs to reduce their stenosis by 10% or greater to have a clinically meaningful regression or reversal of disease, what can happen is someone can start off at, let's just say, 9%, uh, let's just say 28%, right? Let's say someone starts off at 28%. Do they have CAD? Yes, because they're over 20. Let's say they reduce their stenosis by 9%. Okay. Do they now have CAD? No, because they have 19% stenosis, which is lower than 20. Are you following so far? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, would we consider that reversal if our cutoff is 10%? No. So, no. okay, I get it. So it is and isn't reversal at the same time. That's yeah, it is. Pretty stupid. Exactly. So, okay, now I so it. You're not considering it reversal, even though the patient doesn't have CAD anymore. Right. right. So this is a criticism that smart people have fallen for. I don't like my, blame my for falling for it. It's a very subtle logical fallacy called equivocation. And it equivocates based on continuous variables and categorical variables. And we'll go over that. Okay. So... Essentially, the criticism attempts to form either a contradiction or to point out that the definition won't capture what we mean by reversal. It fails to do either. In a case where a patient's 9% absolute stenosis reduction from 28 to 19% would be the reversal and elimination of heart disease, and less than 10% reduction in stenosis would not be the reversal of heart disease, we can derive a contradiction that it is and is not reversal. This criticism fails because it's an equivocation between reversal so for anyone who knows, equivocation is a fallacy where the same sense of the, the same word is being used in a different sense. So for example, um, all, um, all men are, um, all men are mortal. Um, Sally is not a man. Um, therefore we can't say from the premises that Sally is mortal or something like that. Um, I know that's not actually a good argument, but the, the point here would be is that there's an equivocation in the sense of what a man means. In the first premise, a man means um, a man, uh, man is talking about mankind. And in the second premise, man is talking about being a male. So that would be an example of an equivocation. The sense of the same word that is being used has changed. So in this case, the criticism fails because it's an equivocation between reversal with respect to categorical variables. Categorical, so there's different types of data. There's So in this case, there's continuous variables and categorical variables. Continuous variables are things that you can just break down 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, et cetera. It's, they're on a spectrum. So things like cholesterol levels or triglyceride levels or percent stenosis, they're on a numerical spectrum and they can, and they can just be continuously divisible. Uh, categorical variables are different. They are things that are like, cat there are categories. Green, yellow, red. You're a reverser. You're a non-reverser. You're neither a reverser or a non-reverser. Sometimes we can, inc we can make categorical variables based on continuous variables. For example, hypertriglyceridemia is defined by the 2018 ACC AHA guidelines as having a plasma serum level of over 150 milligrams per deciliter or greater, or 1.7 millimoles per liter or greater. That is a categorical variable. Whether you have hypertriglyceridemia or not is a category. The category is based on a continuous variable. The continuous variable is your triglyceride level. Now, Let's say someone has a triglyceride level of 151, okay? And they reduce their triglyceride level by two. Are they going to have hypertriglyceridemia at the end of it? 
No, because their triglyceride level is going to be 149. Would anyone consider this reversal of, the, of hypertriglyceridemia? No one's going to consider that clinically relevant reversal in any sense of the word. Does that mean they're wrong because they're no they no longer are defined to have hypertriglyceridemia? No, it just means we're talking about two different things. The criticism fails because of the equivocation between reversal with respect to categorical variables and reversal with respect to continuous variables. It also fails to point out that the definition wouldn't capture what we mean by reversal because it was never the goal to point out reversal with respect to categorical variables in the first place. Furthermore, few clinicians would care about reversal with respect to categorical variables if the reversal is simply taking place because the continuous variable has already started so close to the cut point that defines the categorical variable. So you can actually entail a hilarious bullet that you need to bite with this. If you think this is a good criticism, uh, you can actually use any uh, cut point with any small amount and say that everything has to be um, with, according to this criticism, anything has to be significant reversal. So, for example, if someone has a triglyceride level of 150.00001 milligrams per deciliter, and they reduce their triglyceride level by 0 0.00002 milligrams per deciliter, they now have a triglyceride level of 149.99999 milligrams per deciliter. And guess what? By the categorical variable, they reverse their hypertriglyceridemia because they no longer have hypertriglyceridemia, technically speaking. Does this mean that a 0 0.00002, sorry, I have to, I'm losing track of that zero. Does this mean a 0 0.0002 milligram per deciliter reduction in triglyceride levels should be considered a reversal of hypertriglyceridemia? No, it doesn't. No one would consider that decrease in triglyceride levels a reversal of hypertriglyceridemia. We're using the word reversal in different senses here, okay? In one sense, we're using the word reversal with respect to a, cat to a continuous variable. That's what we care about. That's where our cut points are coming from, for a continuous variable. And then in another sense, we're using reversal with respect to a categorical variable. It's an equivocation. And no one was talking about reversal with respect to categorical variables in a context where someone's distance is so close to the threshold that defines the categorical cut point anyway. The way to think it, it's not a problem. It happens all the time. You can have a non-significant change in continuous variable push someone over a cut point in a categorical variable, and we wouldn't consider the, continu the variable in the continuous variable to be significant, even though it, it pushed someone over a cut point. The reason we still wouldn't care about that is because very few uh, people in the proportion of the population would start at that point anyway. And even if they were, since it is an arbitrary cut point, it wouldn't make much of a difference anyway. That's not what we're talking about. It's an equivocation. It's not a problem. It happens all the time, and it still captures what we mean. Are you following that, Richard? That made absolute perfect sense to me. So, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so this is not a logical problem. So if somebody goes from 29% to 19%, they've technically crossed the threshold of having heart disease to not having heart disease. <laughs> Again, no, they no, they haven't, and we've explained why this is not a problem. Heart anymore. disease, and that wouldn't count under this definition. In addition, you could have a 50% absolute stenosis regression in two years and one month. This is really hilarious. So what Mike says is, do, he's harping on this statement in the parentheses. He says, due to the from baseline to two years statement, if a 50% absolute stenosis regression is seen at 2.5 years, then there is no disease reversal under this definition. Therefore, this definition is not a definition of heart disease reversal, merely one of many subjective definitions of plaque regression. And the quote is, clinically relevant regression or progression was defined as a nominal change, parentheses from baseline to two years of 10% for percent diameter stenosis and 0 0.2 millimeters pre-specified for MLD. This is a hilarious interpretation of the portion of the definition in the parentheses. The baseline to two years, that quote, is just there because that's the duration of the trial from baseline to follow-up, and that information gives the authors a sense of change per time. The definition doesn't comment on criteria over two years, nor does it specify the rate of change must be 10% in conjunction with 0.2 millimeter uh, minimal, minimal diameter per two years. It simply states that over the course of the follow-up period, the previously mentioned criteria was used. 
Mike says merely one of uh, many subjective definitions of plaque regression. Mike is just confused on several levels here. Firstly, all definitions are social constructs and are subjective, unless Mike wants to take some form of hilarious linguistic objectivist view. Secondly, it's not actually it's actually not one of the many definitions of clinically relevant regression. The, Mike does have a slide where he shows the other definitions. The other definitions usually don't actually specify the definitions being used to evaluate clinical significance or clinical relevance. They are, of course, equally arbitrary, but they are not equivalent in the sense that they are used to evaluate a change, whether in terms of being used to evaluate a change in clinical significance or not. Also, when you get the point, but it do you appreciate what, what Mike's trying to say here? He's trying to say like, oh, since they said in the definition two years, they're saying, okay, well, if it went longer than two years and then all of a sudden yeah. your stenosis regressed a ton, like, yeah, no, it, no, this is- he, It's just yeah. a stupid interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really, yeah. It appears that they abandoned that 10% statistic anyway. We didn't abandon it, Mike. Nope. We just had an even worse destruction of the position. And instead have put in their syllogism a 0.4 millimeter lumen diameter or greater increase to show reversal. And that's and that's from this 2007 okay. paper, and in particular appears to be from this paragraph where it mentions 0.4 a lot. Again, this appears to be subjective. They say that this 0.4 millimeters is taken to represent true change, whether progress. Okay, it doesn't matter why the authors put the 0.4 millimeter in there. So Mike doesn't seem to understand why we put the 0.4 millimeter in the syllogism. It's almost like he seems to be thinking that we put 0.4 in there because, hey, according to this paper, it represents like a, a true regression or regression. That's not why we put the point four in there. I don't care if the authors put it in there for that reason. I don't care if the authors just prayed to God and they got point four. I don't care if the authors made it up. The reason why we put point four in there is because without the point four, that's the value that's been shown to have some significant correlation with the change in the QCA metrics and the change in plaque volume. Without the point four, we would just be left with a continuous variable in which there's no correlation at all. That's the reason why. If they ended up lowering that value and showing a significant relationship, I would be okay with lower values. Whether progression or regression, why did they double what is accepted by many other scientists? We doubled, be we doubled because that is the value that's been shown to have a relationship between change in plaque volume. And lower values haven't. Okay, we found another, arg we found another piece of evidence that says, hey, actually, even with a greater, even um, actually, it's only been shown to have a relationship with 0.4. We haven't shown it for 0.3. We haven't shown it for 0.2. In fact, as a continuous variable, it doesn't correlate at all. It's in many other papers, but they were initially pushing. You get what I'm saying? And it becomes clear when you realize that they're just falling. This is so, fr it, this is really frustrating because he's like, oh, hey, now you're doubling the criteria. And he's almost like trying to present it as if like it's a bad faith thing. Like we don't like, no, we looked at the data and it looks like, oh, actually it turns out that point two hasn't been shown to have a meaningfully relate, significant relationship between changes in plaque volume. So we can't actually go by 2.4 by 2.2 for another reason. Um, that's why we did it. And you could have asked me why I did it and what my reasons were. You have an open line to me, Mike. Following the recommendation of a 1993 study, which found you know, about 0.19 variability between somewhat longer term angiograms. Okay. Um, let's just go over this in depth. Okay. So. Mike says the syllogism. So in his slide deck, it says that there's a syllogism claim of 0.4 millimeter or greater change. Syllogism claim, inner aluminum diameter must change 0.4 millimeters or greater. So this is a complete misrepresentation of the premises of the syllogism. Here's what the syllogism actually said, and here, what, here's what it was used to argue against. So the syllogism is used to argue against epicardial atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease reversal. Premise one of the syllogism says, if the only support shown for EASCVD reversal in humans from a plant-based diet are QCA without 0.4 millimeter or greater criteria, MPI and symptoms slash event outcome-based studies, then it is not the case that plant-based diet has been shown to reverse EAS-CVD in humans. Promise two, the only support shown for EAS-CVD reversal in humans from a plant-based diet are QCA without greater or equal to 0.4 millimeter criteria, MPI and symptom slash event outcome-based studies. 
Conclusion. Therefore, it is not the case that a plant-based diet has been shown to reverse EASCVD in humans. Notice how the premise, inner lumen diameter change must be greater than 0.4 millimeters or greater. Notice how that never actually appears in the syllogism. The 0.4 millimeter or greater criteria is present in the syllogism as part of the material implication. And the only reason it's there is because the other cut points haven't been shown to correlate with change in plaque volume. Mike interpreted, it seems like Mike interpreted the 0.4 millimeter criteria to represent a clinically relevant change as an arbitrary criteria, similar to the 10% stenosis and 0.2 millimeter cut points from the previous argument, as he repeats the same hilarious 20% CAD reductio against it in his slide deck. Mike is just clueless here. And it's clear that he never bothered to take the time to understand why I put that value in the syllogism to begin with. Again, this isn't the reason why 0.4 millimeter was chosen. And it doesn't actually matter why the authors chose 0.4 millimeter, because at the end of the day, the categorical data was only shown to have a relationship with plaque volume using that value. If the categorical data was only shown to have a relationship with plaque volume using a lower cut point as a value, I would be okay with that too. Without that cut point, all we are left with is a continuous variable that has no correlation with change in plaque volume whatsoever. And again, I'll point out that Mike states he rejects the propositions in the syllogism, doesn't address the valid supporting arguments for each premise. If you reject a premise, there's a logically valid supporting argument for each premise. Mike hasn't addressed any of them. Okay. Now Mike uh, goes, says, the standards of deviation of repeat measurements of the minimal lumen. Okay, yeah, so this is where it would come and from. Said, but again, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where it came from. It just at the end of the day, it matters that that's been shown to correlate with plaque volume, changes in plaque volume. Uh, lower values haven't. That's why I didn't use lower values. To be safe. And if they did, I would be okay with using lower values. Let's just double that when something over 0.2 would be more than that variability. Then there's the book QCA and Clinical Practice, which actually compiled a table with different definitions used for regression and other. Notice how they're not definitions. They're not, these are not definitions, a compilation definitions with respect to defining clinically relevant changes. Okay? <coughs> they're definitions used for cut points. Not, find the definition that says a clinically significant or clinically relevant change, okay? Studies, there's so many definitions. Which one do you choose? They even made a definition for Ornish. You know, some researchers chose the 10% stenosis regression. And at the bottom, some chose the 0.4 minimal luminal diameter one. Again, this is subjective. I'll continue to make the case. So yes, all definitions are subjective, Mike. But it seems like you're still not understanding why we went with the 0.4. We went with the 0.4 for a syllogism against the reversal of plaque, which was claimed, because that is the only cut point shown to correlate with changes in plaque as a categorical variable. That's the reason. Not because we just made it up and we went, we said, hey, this is in the literature. We just like, we, this is what we're going with. If you can show a lower value, and is what I'm saying making sense, Richard? Are you, are you following? No, yeah, it, it makes total sense. Um, since Ornish and everyone is, is talking about plaque regression, you're just going with a variable that predicts pro, uh, plaque regression. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's all I'm doing here. I, like, I don't even know why this is hard for Mike to freaking understand. And if it, he could have asked you too, if it was confusing to yeah. him. Yeah. Angiograms, but it's become clear, especially on the Vegan Gains Live, if you saw it, that the main angle here is now that angiograms aren't actually capable of measuring plaque. Therefore, they're... Comp that's not the claim. Okay, the claim is that angio changes in QCA angiography, okay, delta, the delta values of the QCA don't correlate with the delta, va delta values of plaque. Okay, that's a, not the same claim as saying QCA can't measure plaque. So you, measuring plaque as a snapshot in time is not the same thing as measuring a change in plaque over time. All right, so saying, it, it, looking at a correlation between X and Y, is not the same thing as in analyzing a correlation between delta X and delta Y. You can have a correlation between X and Y and absolutely no correlation between delta X and delta Y. And we'll see that. So just to be really clear and hammer it home, what we're saying is the changes in quantitative coronary angiography metrics don't correlate as a continuous variable with changes in plaque volume. 
Okay, that's what we're saying. Therefore, they're completely useless in that sense anyway. And the, and the reason we're saying that is because that's what they did. They looked at changes. That's what Ornish and Elsassin did. They looked at changes in metrics of quantitative coronary angiography, and they claimed regression of plaque volume. They claimed regression of atherosclerosis. They claimed you can regress plaque. So I'm not just, again, I'm not pulling this out of my ass here. We're doing this because that's what the methodology that was used. The main argument there is that when you're looking at other imaging methods that are better, they don't necessarily line up. And it's clear that Ornish and his colleagues were out to prove that there was regression and make a good case for it. And so they went above and beyond angiograms in certain ways. We're going to cover those in a bit. But first, to make these comparisons between different types of imaging, first, you just need to know the basics of them. We have your classic 2D angiogram, which is an x-ray of your heart when dye is put into it that can be picked up by x-ray. They then can take that and quantitatively measure it through tracing by hand or also through computers. We then have CTA or computed tomography angiograms, which also are x-rays of the heart with dye in your system, but they're 3D, they have a lot of images, and then using computers, they sew that 3D model together. And finally, we have IVIS or intravenous ultrasound where they put a tiny little ultrasound camera in your artery. They slide it so that they can get a cross section of your arteries and they can see inside the wall and they can see plaque directly. We all agree that IVIS is the best for that, but Danielle also said that my, minor nitpick, IVIS is not intravenous ultrasound, it's intravascular ultrasound, but whatever. ...is a good enough imaging technique that it should be used in future studies on plant-based diets. Now CTA, okay, let's just be really clear about what the claim is. So, so CTA, I'm going to be really clear here. So C, changes in CTA is good enough for changes in um, plaque volume. Now, I will just say that I know of some... Uh, radiologists who will disagree with that. I know there are some cardiologists who actually don't think C even CTA is good enough, but whatever. Okay, we we're not going to get into that debate. IVIS definitely. I don't know anyone who's going to say that IVIS is not good enough. Now back to this 2007 study because the anti-reversal camp described it as the smoking gun because it also looked at IVIS versus those 2D quantitative angiograms. The the reason it's a smoking gun is because not because it just looked at IVIS versus the QCA. It looked at changes in QCA metrics against changes in plaque volume as measured by QCA. That's why it's a smoking gun, because it looks that's exactly what the methodology relies on. It doesn't rely on just looking at, at correlation between X and Y. It relies on there being a correlation between delta X and delta Y. Are you are you appreciating that difference, Richard? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you can, yeah, go ahead. No, no, the study I'm, I'm used Pier fine. Pearson's R, which is a measure of correlation, it measures how much two things are correlated. If they're perfectly correlated, they are a one. If they're not correlated at all, they are a zero. Generally over 0.3 is considered correlated. Over 0.5 is more strongly correlated and 0.7 is highly correlated. The study seems to send mixed signals. As the anti-reversal party points out, yeah, there isn't a great correlation with plaque volume. Okay, doesn't send mixed signals, Mike. You're just not reading the study. So what it shows is that there is no correlation whatsoever as a continuous variable with changes in quantitative coronary angiography metrics and changes in plaque volume. Okay, those are delta values. There are some correlations with non-delta values. There are weak correlations with delta values of non-plaque metrics, like um, lumen volume. We'll get into that. Uh, that's definitely true, but and the quantitative angiograms did well on what is likely the most important score, the overall coronary artery score, which reflects obstruction, which would have the most impact on disease. The coronary artery score um, on QCA um, correlated with total lumen volume on IVIS at one snapshot at baseline, and the correlation coefficient was 0 0.65, okay? Now, notice how that's not the same thing as asking, what's the correlation between the change in coronary artery score and the change in total lumen volume over time, right? So if you <clears throat> measure this at baseline and you measure this at follow-up, which is what the method, that's the methodology that was done. You use 
you QC at baseline, QC at follow up, you show an improvement. Does that mean that delta shows an improvement with the delta in lumen, uh, total lumen volume? And if there is a correlation, how large is it? Let's actually go to the study and find out. Okay. So here is the part of the paper that uh, Mike has shown. So yes, he's shown this graph, the R value is 0 0.65. But if you actually look at the deltas, which is what we're interested in, how those correlations line up, from the study, quote, change in coronary artery score, QCA, correlated weakly with change in IVUS-derived total lumen volume. R was 0 0.14. So notice that the, the snapshot correlation, which is R of 0 0.65, dropped all the way down to 0 0.14 when you're actually asking the question that we're interested in. The question we're interested in is, if I have this change in QCA score, am I going to get a reliable change in IVUS-derived total lumen volume? The answer is not really, no. Uh, an R value of 0 0.14 is really, really weak. In fact, you can very easily get the opposite. You can usually get worsening of lumen volume with a change in QCA. So again, notice how the correlation coefficient of 0 0.65 drops down to 0 0.14 when looking at correlations of the deltas, which is what we're interested in. And by the way, this is for lumen volume. This isn't even for change in plaque, which was what we were arguing against. So that's a change in the topic. In the case of changes of QCA and plaque volume, it doesn't correlate at all. The correlation R values are right on the zero. Yeah, so basically the data just flat out doesn't say what he's suggesting it shows. Not at all. He's, yeah. he's confused between a snapshot correlation and a correlation in delta values. He's confusing correlations between X and Y and what we're actually interested in, which is, is delta X and delta Y. How well does that correlate? Yeah. Okay. These state from the conclusion, although the change in percent atheroma volume only weakly correlated with QCA changes as continuous variables, disease progression on QCA is associated with significant increase in plaque volume on IVIS compared with no angiographic graphic progression. Okay, so this is, Mike is reading the conclusion of the study and he has no clue where that conclusion is derived from. The QCA is associated with significant increase in plaque volume on IVIS compared to no angiographic progression. That's when progression or regression is defined in terms of the 0 0.4 minimal luminal diameter cut point as a categorical variable, which is why that was in the syllogism in the first place. That's why that statement is in the conclusion. We can go to here. Where did I put this? Okay. Anyway, that's that's the reason. Um, yeah, Mike just reads the conclusion of the study and clearly doesn't understand where the conclusion is derived from. Disease progression on QCA from the conclusion of the study is defined in terms of categorical 0 0.4 minimal luminal minimal luminal diameter millimeter minimal luminal diameter cutoff points, not as a continuous variable. That's why the 0.4 millimeter minimal luminal diameter cut point is built into the syllogism. If I didn't put that there, without that, we're just left with a continuous variable that doesn't correlate at all. So when you when Mike is just reading this, he's just reading the conclusion of the study, he doesn't understand the study he's talking about. He doesn't understand what the, what they're saying and why that conclusion is there, what it's derived from and what it's defined in terms of. And so he's going to just read this and say, oh, look, how can you say it doesn't correlate? The conclusion says it correlates. Yes, it says it correlates if you define the regression or progression in terms of a 0.4 mil millimeter MLD cut point. We agree with that. We put it in the syllogism for that reason because we agree with that. Progression is the regression, so just kind of interesting to flip it in the sentence. It would be disease regression on QCA is associated with slack volume on IVIS. 
And regret again, regression in the study was also defined in terms of a improvement of 0.4 millimeter ml paired with no angiographic regression. So that would be relevant to the studies. The conclusion of the study is that there is correlation between those angiograms and IVIS. Those angiograms still had correlations for metrics that matter a lot in heart disease. And the question again, yeah. So again, if it's defined in terms of the 0.4 cut point, yes, there's a correlation. If not, all we know of is the continuous variable, which has no correlation. And here is, is total atherosclerosis being measured? And the reason it's meaningful to point out that the only, that, that the, it's only been shown to correlate with the 0.4 is that none of the dietary interventions kiss the toes of 0.4 or is it not being measured by angiograms? And that's what brings me to the next study, this 2012 study. This is also an IVIS versus angiogram study. It looked at a bunch of different methods for quantifying angiograms and looked at how correlated they were with IVIS. And they particularly looked at atherosclerotic plaque burden and atherosclerotic plaque area. Their conclusion was all scores correlated significantly with average plaque burden and plaque area by IVIS. So again, there's a... This is not delta values. This is correlation between X and Y, not delta X and X and Y. You're, this su study Mike is talking about here is looking at a snapshot correlation, right? So um, yeah, here it is. Um, what is, no, this is FFR, yeah. So it was never claimed that there was not going to be a correlation as a snapshot variable. The, what the claim was is that you're not going to have a correlation of deltas as those variables. So you can look at plaque burden at a single point in time, and you can get some kind of, by the way, this correlation co coefficients are not really not even that impressive. But that's just for a snapshot point in time. We saw a 0.64 correlation coefficient dropped to 0 0.14 when you're talking about deltas. What's it going to drop to for these values? I don't know. Mike doesn't know. And when you actually look at the delta correlations, they actually, for, for a continuous variable, for changes in plaque volume compared to the changes in QCA, they dropped near close to zero. Nothing was even statistically significant. It was sitting on the zero. So again, Mike's just confused about correlations between X and Y, and he's not understanding that what we're interested in is correlation in delta X and delta Y. And we're talking R values of 0.56 with the most common ones up around 0.7, so. Nothing here is delta values. All of these are correlations between X and Y. Highly correlated. And I can't explain why one IVA study showed mediocre correlation with plaque and the other showed pretty high correlation. I can. So one study showed no correlation with plaque because they're looking at changes in plaque volume and correlated with changes in QCA metrics. And the other study showed a correlation because they're not looking at that. They were looking at thing, other things than that, which are snapshot correlations. By the way, when you look at the first study and they look at snapshot correlations, they're also correlated. The studies agree, snapshot correlations correlate, great. But what we're interested in, the delta QCA and the delta of the IVIS metrics, those aren't correlated for change in plaque volume. The first study was the only study to do that. The second study didn't do that. That's why there's an apparent difference that you're just not appreciating. But are you appreciating it, Richard? No. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it makes perfect sense to me. I'm pretty sure most people watching by now would pretty easily understand. OK. But taken together, it seems to be a strong case for QCA finding regression. So if you nope, it's not. It's a it, it is the nail in the coffin for QCA not being able to perform regression, as virtually every interventional cardiologist agrees with. Mike, there's my little appeal to authority or two. Just kidding. I don't want to make appeals to the authorities. If you consider IVIS a accurate measure of atherosclerotic plaque burden, and it correlates highly with these angiograms, then you have to say that angiograms can have meaningful findings here. <laughs> no. Oh, this is brutal. Oh, man. No. So the fact that it correlates with the snapshot variable doesn't mean we have to conclude that it has meaningful findings when we're interested in delta variables just doesn't follow. And when you look at the data, it turns out to be the case.
Sorry. Next, let's look at TA again, those 3D angiograms, which the anti-reversal party said would be good enough for future studies to determine reversal. That means that if our 2D angiograms correlate highly with these CTA scans, then they should also be good enough to determine reversal. This study by Voro said all- No, no. Again, he's just saying that if a snapshot correlation correlates, then the delta correlations correlate. Yeah. No, they don't. All is another interesting study because it looked at all three of these measures. And comparing CTA and those quantitative angiograms directly, the results are insanely similar. They're insanely similar, and they're not because they're twofold. Number one, it's a snapshot correlation, not a change of correlation. Number two, because you're not measuring what we're even interested in measuring. You're measuring percent diameter stenosis. We're interested in measuring plaque. We're measuring now, so there's a twofold conflation now. He's looking at a correlation between, instead of looking at a correlation of delta X and delta Y with respect to Z, he's looking at a correlation between X and Y with respect to B. So in, he's instead of looking at plaque or plaque burden or plaque volume, what he's looking at is percent diameter stenosis. And instead of looking at the delta values, he's looking at the snapshot values. Like I don't even was, know where to begin. He was using a very nebulous sort of definition of heart disease reversal to begin with. So I think his mind just kind of conflates everything. Yeah. We're talking about less than 1% variation in diameter stenosis. And this other study found a very statistically significant. Does Mike not realize that you can have a tight correlation between percent diameter stenosis and no correlation in plaque volume? Like, no, does he think that it therefore sense. follows that you're going to have a correlation in plaque volume? I don't think he gets get it. it. Like, if it correlates with respect to A, then it must correlate with respect to B. No, no. In fact, there's solid evidence that says for delta and delta B, it doesn't correlate. Very statistically significant, pretty solid 0.6 R correlation. Same thing, QCA and gradient stenosis, 0.6 R correlation. On CT, that's a snapshot correlation. We already saw a 0.64 drop to 0.14 for a different metric for a lumen volume. Does Mike know what the correlation coefficient is going to drop to for the deltas? Zero. No, he doesn't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we, we do because we actually have data showing it drops to zero. So anyway. And for over stenosis grading in QCA versus CTA. So you can't say one is good and the other is useless. Ugh. We're saying one is good for purpose A and the other is useless for pur for purpose A. And you're looking at different purposes. Like they could be good. Things could be good for different purposes and bad for other purposes. Like you can have something that's good for measuring percent stenos diameter stenosis, even though it's very questionable how meaningful that is because of the whole reference artery problem. And they could be terrible for measuring change in plaque volume. You can have something that's good for this purpose and bad for that purpose. It's not, if something's good, it doesn't mean it's good for all purposes. The study also looks at another measure, which is highly clinically relevant in terms of diagnosing CAD and severity, and that is fractional flow reserve. No, it's a I agree with this. Fractional, fractional flow reserve is important, and that is me. Measure the disturbance of blood flow within the artery and a marker for the risk of your heart not getting enough blood, and it's used to determine whether or not a stint should be put in. Well, Voros and colleagues are for so I'll the just risk go back of your here heart and I'll just, just show this. So in FFR, what you can do is you can actually um, measure the pressures um, pre-stenosis and post-stenosis, okay? And you can infer the blood flow based on those differences in, in pressure. Okay. That's that's valuable. You can you can get a good sense of what the blood flow is. Um, fine. Marker for the risk of your heart not getting enough blood, and it's used to determine whether or not a stint should be put in. Well, Voros and colleagues also looked at FFR and compared that to all three of the other imaging techniques, and it turns out that the 2D angiograms, for whatever reason, were the most correlated with fractional flow reserve of any of the As a snapshot correlation. So number one, we're not talking about plaque anymore. We're talking about blood flow. Fine. But we're talk now you're talking about a correlation as again, a snap I can't repeat I'm just gonna be repeating myself. Yeah. A snapshot <laughs> correlation instead of a delta correlation. We again we saw 0 0.64 drop to 0 0.14. We saw other things drop down to zero. Does Mike know how far the 0 0.67 is gonna drop? No, he doesn't. 
um, for for flow. Um, so yeah. The three more correlated Ivis. Um, was there another point? Oh yeah, there was another point. Um, the Ornish study did not measure FFR. They measured SFR. We'll get into that difference. Ivis. And this brings me back to Ornish and how it was clear that they wanted more than just the angiograms to show that these stenoses were shrinking and changing. So him and his colleague Gould, who is a cardiologist, went and looked at another metric, which they call stenosis flow reserve. They said, quote, to definitively address whether progression or regression occurs in humans with risk factor modification, we performed multidimensional analyses of arteriographic stenoses to determine stenosis flow reserve as a single functional measure of severity incorporating all geometric dimensions of each stenosis. What is stenosis flow reserve? Well, they say it's a measure of severity integrating several dimensions into a single number reflecting the capacity for increased flow through the observed geometry for a standardized aortic pressure. Complicated stuff. It is based on the concept of coronary flow reserve proposed 17 years ago by Gould et al. and has evolved into an accepted measure of functional stenosis severity. Hey, Richard, from what Mike has just said, do you understand what stenosis flow reserve is? No. <laughs> okay. Do you think anyone understands what stenosis flow reserve is? No, From probably this? not anybody watching. Do you think Do you think Mike himself understands what stenosis flow reserve is? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we're going to go over what it is. So first and foremost, stenosis flow reserve is not a measurement of blood flow. Stenosis flow reserve is an inference of a pressure drop Remember that FFR when we looked at the different pressures across pre and post -stenosis? Yeah. It's an attempt to make an inference of a pressure drop across a vessel by measuring the diameter of the stenotic segment and reference SFR is a calculated theoretical pressure drop across a coronary stenosis by assuming certain things. It assumes coronary resting flow velocity of 15 centimeters per second. And it's a formula that accounts for differences in laminar flow and tur tur uh, turbulent flow resistance. The only things that are measured for to go to the SFR in the QCA metrics are really just the minimal luminal diameter in the reference artery. Um, the cross-sectional areas can be calculated, and the Q values can be derived from the cross-sectional areas and the assumed flow velocities and just assuming the same amount of Q flow between the two things. So here's the formula. So this is the formula for the pressure drop. And here are the things that are being measured. A um, uh, subscript S is the cross-sectional area of the stenotic segment. That's one thing that's being measured, right? Because you can get the cross-sectional area of the stenotic segment by measuring the, the diameter of the stenotic segment. And uh, A uh, subscript of N is the, well, I know it's not like a NN, but it's a cross-sectional area of the reference vessel. That's being measured too. You can measure, you can assume the 15 centimeter per second flow rate, and you can get the, uh, the Q value by just calculating the flow rate multiplied by the cross-sectional area for one and assume Q1 and Q2 are going to be the same. You can get you can get the flow rate. A Q1, the Q values for each are going to be the same. So um, based on that, you can get the pressure drop. You can infer blood flow from that. It's not, you're not measuring blood flow. You're measuring the cross-sectional areas of the stenotic segment and the reference segment, and you're trying to calculate the pressure drop. Essentially, what you're trying to do is you're trying to approximate what the FFR is measuring, which is the pressure drop. Okay? So if you have a... Um, anyway, okay. So what's the issue with this? Why... Um, so first of all, let's just continue the video and let's see the point he's trying to make. And they did, in fact, show that their intervention improved stenosis flow reserve. They say severe stenoses showed a 45% increased stenosis flow reserve. I don't know how that isn't reversal of stenosis. We'll go over why it's not, um, but okay. So I can tell this video is getting really long. Okay, so here's the same, the same issue applies. So FFR is a gold standard since the actual pressure differences are measured but the correlations between stenotic flow reserve and FFR are not impressive, even at snapshot periods in time. In this study, the study I'll, I'll link, actually, the uh, yeah, so the study I'll link, the R-value correlations between FFR and stenotic flow reserve was 0 0.47. Again, we previously saw a correlation coefficient of 0 0.64 uh, drop down to 0 0.14 when looking at correlations of deltas. We can only speculate how low the correlation coefficient of 0.47 will drop for delta SFR and delta FFR. 
The same criticism applies for myocardial FFRs, despite modestly higher correlation coefficients for snapshot correlations. Higher R values for myocardial FFR reported that I'm aware of. The highest one was 0.78 in a cohort from 1995. But that was when, but that was post PCTA. That's uh, percutaneous, um, <coughs> sorry, P, uh, PCA, uh, P, PCA transluminal uh, angioplasty. A percutaneous transluminal angioplasty was pooled with a non percutaneous transluminal angioplasty. And almost all of the patients in Ornish's study had SFR measured not after PCTA, which brings the R value down to 0 0.61 uh, from that study. So again, we could only, the, the same problem is, if you're going to use SFR, which is a snotic flow reserve, based on some inference from the QCA metrics to try to approximate FFR, it has a very, doesn't have a very impressive correlation as a snapshot variable. We don't know what the correlation is going to be for the deltas. So FFR is the gold standard. You can truly, it's easy and you can truly infer like what the flow is from FFR based on the pressure drop. Fine. You can't do that with SFR. So SFR is a lot harder because you can have a very impressive SFR and it can actually be worsening of blood flow because the correlation coefficient can just drop to something very low. It's not even that great in snapshot values to begin with. So again, I can't stress this point enough. When correlations drop low and get close to zero, you can have a very impressive result. And the direction of the result of the variable you are trying to track is literally in the opposite direction that the result indicates. In this case, the impressive stenosis flow reserve fails if the delta correlations drop, which they almost certainly will, and can actually be a reflection of worsening blood flow for the group consuming a plant-based diet, not improved blood flow. The other thing I'll note is that the uh, they didn't mention if the they mentioned a statistically significant difference between the baseline experimental group and the and the follow-up experimental group, but they didn't mention if there was a statistically significant difference between the the SFR of the control group and the experimental group because it actually improved a little bit too, point uh, by point three five. Do we know will will it be different? I don't know. Neither does Mike. Maybe it will, but even if it will. It doesn't matter because the correlation is weak with FFR as a snapshot, and we have no idea what the correlation will be as a delta. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to accelerate a little bit through the next points, and one of those is PET scans that Ornish and colleagues have done. I agree. I, I'm pretty sure the other side thinks that PET scans alone would not determine reversal, but again, this is a total picture here. And from the American Heart Association, quote, a PET scan is a very accurate way to diagnose coronary artery disease and detect areas of... Just because you're, a test is accurate to diagnosing coronary artery disease doesn't mean it's accurate in determining reversal of coronary artery disease. The low blood flow in the heart. Another area I just have to mention more specifically is endothelial function. Again, that inner lining of the artery. And we see from this study, which yes, it's on peripheral artery disease, but it measures things okay. like nitric... This is... This is not a study. This is the, I mean, it, this is an abstract. All right, let's just be accurate about it. This was published later as a study. Okay, so we'll get into the actual study. Um, but this is, this is just this is an abstract uh, that was published. Things like nitric oxide, which is obviously going throughout your whole body and is super huge in terms of dilation and preventing platelet aggregation and stickiness of things like macrophages to lesions, which helps them grow into foam cells and that's what pops and causes. Anyway, you get the whole point. But they measured a 240% increase in this case. And to me, this really contributes to reversal because it is not an external factor leading to this nitric oxide or this dilation. We are talking about a internal process that has regenerated so that they can produce nitric oxide again. Also worth mentioning, the study found increased artery function. Moving on, here's the one I just want to mention. So what Mike is trying to do now is say, okay, so here's another thing that makes up heart disease, which is a non-obstructive coronary artery disease, which is endothelial function. And then he cherry picks one RCT, which has shown improvement endothelial function. We're not going to cherry pick. We're going to go through all of the trials on vegan and low fat whole food plant based diet that looks at endothelial function. Okay. So, okay. So let's go to endothelial function. Endothelial function, though. So, uh, Mike cherry picks one study. Um, to my knowledge, there are three RCTs investigating the effect of a uh, low-fat, whole-food, plant-based diet or a vegan diet 
and I'm not including Mediterranean diet. We'll get into the Mediterranean diet on endothelial function um, as well. First, let's just go over endothelial function. So endothelial function is measured in terms of flow mediated dilation. It's your artery's ability to uh, dilate. Um, that's the metric. Uh, because when you have poor endothelial function, the artery doesn't have the ability to dilate. When your artery has better endothelial function, it has a better ability to dilate, get the blood where it needs to go. There are mediators that play a role in that, like nitric oxide. That's an important vasodilator. And endothelial function, I want to be very clear about this. I'm not talking about post prandial endothelial function. I'm talking about chronic endothelial function, a uh, dysfunction, regardless of what you eat. So there's a lot of studies out there on post prandial endothelial function. I'm actually not convinced this is a valuable metric. I'm not convinced changes in post prandial endothelial function actually predict uh, CBD events. I've never, I'm not convinced it's ever been shown. What has been shown to predict CBD events is, um, chronic uh, disturbances in endothelial function regardless of what you eat. So maybe a diet can change that. That's fine. Maybe if you, ideally you'd want them to be fasting or to get rid of the postprandial effect. But maybe a diet can improve your endothelial function in that chronic sense, regardless of what you eat. Um, regardless of what you eat, meaning regardless of the postprandial effects. Okay, cool. The RCTs didn't specify if they were fasting or not, but that's fine. I don't, I don't, but whatever. I'll let that go. To my knowledge, there are three RCTs investigating the effect of a low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet on endothelial function. Studies on postprandial endothelial function not include for obvious reasons. Aside from the numerous problems with the study Mike cites, but, and by the way, those problems are include using running uh, 90 different uh, p-value comparisons for the endpoints, having 30 different endpoints and running 90 different uh, statistical comparisons without any correction for problem of multiple comparisons. We don't have to get into the problem of multiple comparisons and p-hacking. Um, if Mike wants to have that conversation and how hilarious the study was, we can go into that. Um, I'll just tell you that I ran uh, the multiple comparison statistic correct statistical corrections myself, and it really doesn't matter which one you do. Uh, nothing would be statistically significant from that trial if you do if you pick any of them. If you pick any um, valid uh, correction for the problem of multiple comparisons, uh, nothing would be significant from that study. And particularly endothelial function differences would be significant from that trial that Mike is citing. But we'll ignore that. We'll just pretend they only looked at endothelial function and didn't um, run 90 different p-value tests. It's important not to cherry pick any single study to evaluate treatment effect. A meta-analysis that subsumes the three trials would be a stronger inference. We performed it now. For, to keep this video short, so I listed my work in the Discord server. It's very tedious and it does a lot of back calculation. You can, it's all listed there if anyone wants to check it. But the results just miss statistical significance when you perform a meta-analytic summation. Now, I understand that some of these effects, you may know, look and say, oh, wait a minute, why is the confidence interval uh, pointing over here for this study and this study. I understand that different tests can push you over or are under these values. And I understand that this meta analytic summation just misses statistical significance at a p-value 0 0.06. So I can let that go. I understand if you do an ANOVA versus if you do a pair TCS or unpaired TCS. I, I understand that you can have slightly different results. Um, that's fine. We can let it go. But notice how this just compares the endothelial function treatment effects of the plant-based diet compared to the control. Remember, we're in the same issue, Richard? Right. Two questions. We're not just claiming plant-based diet is better. If we were just claiming plant-based diet is better, this is all we would need. Yeah, you're talking we're about We're making a further claim. Yeah. That plant-based diet improves where you are to begin with, not, that just, not just that it prevents things from getting worse. So when you do that, here are the results for standard mean difference and mean difference. And I'll just say before that, regardless of whether you do standard mean difference or mean difference, this um, would miss statistical significance. Um, but we'll let it go because of the difference in tests. Uh, however, I'm not going to let the p-value of 0 0.14 go over here. Um, this trial actually showed that, the hilariously enough, the point value for the, the this diet, um, the, the vegan diet, 
actually, uh, the point estimate was actually worsening of endothelial function, but we can't really say much because the confidence interval is above and below. It's really just sitting at the zero, quite frankly. Um, and then these other two studies which showed improvement, guess which team ran those studies, Richard? Who do you think they might be? Ornish and Esselstyn? Yeah, or either, yeah, or, or yeah. either Ornish or Esselstyn and friends. Um, Inter whenever you do the vegan diet, um, interesting enough, when the vegan diet is ran with endothelial function being looked at without Ornish and, and crew or Esselstyn and crew, um, hey, guess what? The results weren't found. Um, anyway, but regardless, uh, regardless, when you do the meta-analytic summation, there's no statistically significant improvement uh, from baseline to follow-up. The results are null. Again, we, the best we can say with some degree of confidence is that a plant-based diet can prevent your endothelial function from getting worse, but we cannot say with confidence that a plant-based diet improves your endothelial function from baseline. So I agree, plant-based diet is better. I agree it can prevent things from getting worse. I don't agree it shows reversal. We can't say that with confidence. Another hilarious point Guess which diet in a meta-analytic summation did actually show significantly improved endothelial function compared to the control group in a meta-analysis? The Mediterranean diet. That's right, those olive oil-loving Mediterranean diet people. Um, randomized control trials were include if they had met two of the following. High MUFA to SFA fat ratio, use of olive oil as a main cooking ingredient, Richard, so they didn't just use the olive oil they cooked with it. Oh my God, no. Cooking with oil, ugh. Yeah. Next, low to moderate red wine consumption. Next, high consumption of legumes, high consumption of grains and cereals, high consumption of fruits and vegetables, low consumption of meat and meat products, and increased consumption of fish, moderate consumption of milk and dairy products. Do you know what's funny about this? I know there are some low fat, whole food, plant-based people who would actually probably be more pissed off of the fact that they're using olive oil as the main cooking ingredient than the fact that they're increasing their fish consumption and having moderate milk and dairy product consumption. Yeah, yeah. That's really sad. Yeah, I, I just know that there are gonna be some people like that. Um, this ideology built off oil just needs to end. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, olive oil is fucking but, awesome. Goes good with hummus, man. <laughs> Here's the meta-analytic summation for flow media dilation. You can see the uh, mean difference and p-value. Uh, so it was statistically significant at 0 0.02 in the meta-analytic summation. Here's the confidence interval, 0 0.23 to 3.48. It doesn't cross one. Now, to be fair, this is just a meta-analytic summation of the Mediterranean diet compared to the control group. I have yet to do the analysis to see if it's statistically significant with respect to the experimental group baseline to experimental group follow-up. So again, we may be able to say Mediterranean diet prevents endothelial function from getting worse. Yeah. Can we say the Mediterranean diet improves endothelial function from baseline? Not necessarily. Let's continue. I mentioned briefly, and that is this study by Fleming who put people on what I- Oh, this is really bad. All right, we'll get into Richard Fleming. I consider a plant-based diet it is the same fat profile that other plant-based doctors use. And he kind of pinned low carb people up against people on the more plant-based diet. He didn't do that. We'll get into the actual methodology. They used echo. They didn't go crazy with IVIS or anything. But the regression claims are interesting because they were in the journal Angiology and they haven't been retracted. Not a randomized control trial also worth mentioning, but in the low carb group, they saw what he deemed a 40% overall progression of coronary artery disease. But the overall effect seen in the treatment group was a 23% regression in the extent of coronary artery disease and a 22% reduction in the severity of coronary artery disease, which was statistically significant. And that was over 12 months, again, just contributing to the general picture of things. Things and one so let's go through Richard Fleming's study so so Richard Fleming um, I'll just just say it straight out um, he's a self-admitted fraud um, Mike makes a note of mentioning that his paper is not retracted the fact that his paper is not retracted from the journal doesn't mean we shouldn't be su suspicious of it. He has a notorious history. He's convicted of fraud, by the way. He has, including falsifying clinical trial data. He has a history of 
making up myocardial perfusion imaging. Um, uh, perfusion. By the way, Mike says that he just used the echocardiography. I don't know if he just said he, he used that. Really, the point here for the blood flow is he used myocardial perfusion imaging, that modality. He has a history of making up that he did MPI tests when he never actually did them. Okay. And he's been convicted of this. So, and by the way, he's the only author on that paper. Okay. Hmm. So here's Here's the link to that. And, and other journals have retracted his papers. They've been like, wait a minute, we can't have this guy in there. But this paper, this journal didn't. So what? Literally, the modality that this guy is using to show increased in blood flow, one of the fraud, fraud, uh, fraudulent things that Fleming was convicted of was submitting payment claims for tomographic myocardial perfusion imaging studies that he did not actually perform. So he's fabricated MPI studies that he never actually did. He has a history of fabricating clinical trial data and submitting it to journals. He also has been convicted of uh, uh, Medicare fraud. Um, he's, he's had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for this. He's been disbarred from the FDA. And I have a link to all of this in the, uh, the Discord server. But let's just say for the sake of the argument, just to be super charitable to Mike, let's just say that Richard Fleming, the convicted fraud and sole author of a primary investigational study, actually performed the study and didn't fabricate the results like he did all the other times. Firstly, this was not a randomized control trial, nor was it even a robust prospective cohort study. The control group, so Mike, remember Mike said he pitted them up against the other, the control group wasn't just comprised of subjects in the treatment group and the uh, all the control group was was subjects in the treatment group that discontinued the diet. That's not a valid comparator group. It's not like he took low carb and plant based and, and compared them prospectively. He took plant based people prospectively uh, followed them. And then the people who dropped off to a low carb diet, the drop offs he compared them to. There's a million and a half confounders that come with dropping off of a diet. Yeah. Also, he didn't adjust for any confounding factors at all. No valid control, no valid comparator group. And there's an evidence hierarchy. And we also have the Ornish study. The Ornish study was actual randomized controlled trial. And guess what? When you look at the statistical analysis from experimental baseline to follow up, the results are null. Okay, so we so I don't know why this would this paper from a fraud with this specific fraudulent modality that was not a controlled trial, not even a good prospective study, not a valid comparator group, no adjusting confounding factors. Why would we take that over the Ornish study that didn't show statistically significant results from baseline to follow up? I don't know. Anyway. And one cool just anecdotal case study, we need more studies obviously worth mentioning, is Osfeld's case study of someone with heart failure who was down at about a 20% ejection fraction, and they got them right up to the cutoff with a plant-based diet of 55%. A case study is an anecdote. We don't infer that interventions, um, we don't infer that interventions uh, cause outcomes based on case studies. We just don't. You're over 55% and you don't have heart failure, so that's hopeful. And there's another interesting study here of 121 people worth mentioning. It was out of India, collaborating with the University of Alabama, using blinded QCA, and they broke 10% diameter stenosis shrinkage in 50% of their patients. It was described as a low-fat vegetarian diet, but with cholesterol less than 50 milligrams a day or a quarter of an egg, yeah, this is a quasi-vegan diet. wasn't randomized, sadly, but at least it echoes the Ornish findings. You know, it clinically demonstrates reversal at the 10%. Oh. So... Again, it, it's 10% in conjunction with 0.2 millimeters minimal luminal diameter. They did not report minimal luminal diameter. They didn't report what percentage of patients um, broke the 10% and minimum 2.2 minimal luminal diameter. And by the way, guess what? Q, turns out QCA doesn't do that. Doesn't measure what we're looking to measure anyway. Sorry. Also, the more more regression, which is pretty compelling. But it's worth noting they did medicate as well. In conclusion, there's just with nitrates, by the way, and one went, and some had great changes in their nitrates and came, especially in the most adherent group, have gone off their nitrates and they would be expected to have difference in vasodilations. 
This is especially important when we're talking about the coronary remodeling and how uh, around 40, 50%, you can have compensation between the stenotic segment that doesn't equally dilate the reference artery segment. But whatever, regardless, QC, changes in QCA don't correlate with changes in plaque volume and very, very, very weakly correlate. Changes in QCA very weakly correlate with changes in even lumen volume much more going on with a plant-based diet in the literature than stenosis reversal. I believe there is a strong case for these angiograms showing true stenosis reversal, especially when combined with other metrics like that flow reserve. In addition, if you see... So we went through everything. We're going through everything Mike has said. He doesn't know what he's talking about when he's talking about SFR. He tries to just... He's just grasping. He's trying to grasp for anything to just cling to this position. None of it's panning out, Mike. You say that CTA is good enough, and you say that IBIS is good enough, if you're seeing high levels of correlation for total... We're saying CTA is good enough and IBIS is good enough for the delta to the delta, okay? Atherosclerotic burden, and you're making the claim about atherosclerotic disease. No, We're making the claim about the delta of atherosclerotic disease, not the snapshot, Mike. There appears to be a bit of a contradiction there, same go... There is no contradiction, Mike. This is... Do you, Richard, you're following what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I'm he, making the same, I'm just making the same point a million times. I, I know. <laughs> it's, it's getting really tired. <laughs> yeah. Same goes for the CTA scans. Very correlated. How does one work and not the other? And Ornish's previous study showing the... F I'm not going to make the same point. I, I, I can't, I can't do it. I, everyone knows what point I'm going to make. 41% of subjects regressing past 10% absolute death. 41% subjects did not regress past 10% for all stenoses. That was a subsection. And again, a lot of that was just because the reference diameter decreased. Diameter stenosis. And we have so many other things in the literature supporting this, the lower event rate by 60%. Okay, I don't, listen, lower event rate, if you think lower event rate is reversal of heart disease, we're just never gonna agree. If, if you have heart disease and you can do something that prevents getting another heart attack, that doesn't mean you, let's say you have a heart attack and you do something that prevents getting a second heart attack. You haven't reversed your first heart attack. I'm well, sorry. You just haven't. Dude, what's so weird is didn't he, in this video, didn't he give an example of heart disease reversal potentially occurring with some sort of medication, but an increasing event risk? No, he, I think he just did that to show that, like, there are more things than one thing. I don't think that would okay, be a representation. Okay, yeah, because... Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, he's still he's still wrong. I mean, you can actually... Yeah. You, you can index it to the different types of heart disease. You can reverse one heart disease and increase another type of heart disease. There's no problem with that. You yeah. can reverse plaque burden and increase heart attack, uh, heart attack rate. Fine. Yeah, that, um, that's still kind of contradictory. Like, if he's saying lower cat events equals reversal than what he just said earlier just still contradicts what he said like it, I, if, he's, if you sense. think lower cat of, yeah if, if you think lower cat events means reversal of heart disease i i don't even know what to tell you um yeah, the, it, yeah we're not going to agree look i addressed the regression of stenosis that fails i addressed the well we're going to address the lower angina episodes i uh address the heart flow the the increased heart flow by the way he cites esselstein here instead of ornish um I actually emailed Mike uh, the point about the Ornish uh, MPI study not meeting statistical significance between the experimental group and the control group. He did not, he, and I emailed him days before he released this video. He didn't respond to me. Hmm. Um, so it's, and if you look at the Esselstein citation, it's just a, it's just an exa one example. It's not even the study. Um, again, we don't make inferences based on one case. I addressed the improved endothelial function. Um, I will address the lower angina episodes and I will address the lower inflammation um, and all these points fail. And again, with lower CAD events, I agree about lower CAD events, but if you think that's a reversal of heart disease, I don't know what to tell you. And it's beyond not reversal. Even crazy beyond, yeah, it's beyond reversal, not anti-reversal, Mike. It's beyond reversal. Easy lower event rate in Esselstyn's fully vegan diet. We're also talking about 30% lower inflammation. We're talking about way lower. In Let's go to the inflammation. Okay, so again, so Mike has cited uh, one trial that looked at inflammation. By the way, do you know which trial Mike cited? No. It's the same. It's the same trial, by the way. It's the it's the SAW study. Um, or I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, 
But it's the same trial that found that there was no difference in endothelial function mm -hmm. in the vegan diet. So it's interesting. So I just want to point out that the trial that wasn't, wasn't from Ornish and friends or Esselstyn and friends that found a no improvement in endothelial function, uh, that's actually a trial that Mike cites for CRP, interestingly enough. Anyway, again, we don't cherry pick one trial. A meta-analytic summation is more robust and gives us a better picture. Here is what the meta-analytic summation looks like. The results are null compared to the control. Um, the p-value is 0 0.28. Uh, you could cherry pick away any of these individual trials. It wouldn't change the summation. However, what I will say is that there is a hypothesis that adherence plays a role. And when you substratify the trials based on a uh, time frame, you will get a summation that uh, is favoring the control between one to six months. Some people theorize that that's where compliance is best in the vegan diet. And the long-term studies, people start dropping off compliance with the vegan diet. Uh, Short-term is not that compliant. It, does that actually pan out? I don't really know. Uh, but just for the sake of intellectual honesty, I'm going to mention that. Uh, so at the end of the day, does CR, do, can we say it improves inflammation? Maybe, maybe. I don't think it's a strong case that it's been shown. I think we really need to do a lot of work. And because anytime you subsection off studies based on time frame, you introduce intertrial uh, covariates into your meta-analysis. So there's limitations to that. We would have to do a lot of investigation to see if this pans out. And I don't know if this pans out. OK, what else? Angina, the better endothelial. OK, improved angina. So let's go through that. Um, let's go through the improved angina. So this is from the Ornish paper. Can you see this, Richard? Yep, you can see okay. it just fine. All right, so this is the Ornish paper. Um, this is the improved angina. So you can see that the, so here you have the experimental group, here you have the control group, and they had three different endpoints. They had chest pain frequency in times per week, chest pain duration in, in minutes, and chest pain severity, a one to seven scale. Um, as you can see, at one year, the experimental group got better, and that's where the 90 whatever percent comes from, uh, chest pain frequency. Chest pain duration improved, chest pain severity improved in the control group and got in the experiments group, and it got worse in the control group. Looks great. Nothing statistically significant in five years, but the authors have an explanation for that. They say that some people had in the control group had interventions between the one-year mark and the five-year mark. So we're just looking at the one-year mark to, because there were no interventions. Fine. But remember, this p-value, what does it represent? Baseline to one year. I only see one metric where it's statistically significant compared to the control. That's the chest pain severity. Fine, that's still meaningful. I'll note that the p-value of 0.08 is not statistically significant in terms of that chest pain uh, frequency or duration. But you'll notice that all p-value levels are two-tailed, and each is a result of a test of the null hypothesis, hypothesis that the change between two particular visits, baseline in one year, does not differ between the experimental control groups. So remember, what is this question asking, Richard? Is it asking if you're improved from baseline statistically significantly? No, it's not. It's asking if you're better than you would have been otherwise, which is better than if you are from a control group. Are you following that? Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, yeah, cool. Um, so I just plugged the numbers in to see if any of these were statistic endpoints were statistically significant with respect to baseline to follow up. None of them are. All of them are not statistically significant. Now, to be fair, and by the way, if you want to look at this um, this point here, you can't do this. This is not you can't do a meta analytic summation of all of these because they're not independent variables. This I'm, I just did this to check the statistical significance of either of these. So don't look at this and say, ah, statistically significant summation. Like no, you, you, you're summating related variables that are not independent of each other, um, just to artificially decrease your variance. Okay, so can we say now? Look, th maybe this is a power issue. Maybe the results are not statistically significant due to a power issue because the results would not be statistically significant with even larger trial. The only way to find out is to perform an appropriately powered study. Either way, it, may, it remains that reversal has not been shown. Not to mention, re reversal of symptoms, I don't even take the view that that's reversal of disease anyway. Yeah. yeah. But just for whatever it's worth, it's, that's not statistically significantly. 
function and on and on. So it's hard for me to feel like a crazy vegan making this claim when the case is strong enough for the Lancet, again, number two medical journal, the case was strong enough for the Lancet 30 years ago before we had any of these imaging results. Sorry. Oh, it's strong enough for the NIH. It's strong. It's not strong enough for the NIH. The NIH does not make a comment that he showed reversal. Strong enough to be accepted and paid for by Medicare. Medicare paying for it doesn't hinge on it accepting that Orange has had shown reversal. We went through that already. And insurance companies. Finally, there's a lot in the discussion of can what you're claiming be used to validate a carnivore diet reversing heart disease? And I think it's very clear based off this comprehensive view of heart disease that a carnivore diet keto diet, low carb diet, none of them come anywhere close to reversing heart disease. I agree with that. I agree. None of them, none of them come close to reversing heart disease. I also don't agree that the vegan diet has been shown to reverse heart disease either. Um, but I do agree that if in the future, when we do have evidence that can show it, I, I do suspect the vegan diet, if there is any diet, the vegan diet would probably be the closest one, um, followed shortly by the Mediterranean diet, um, if not equivalent. Um, but if I had to put my money on one making it, I would suggest the vegan diet does make it. I agree with that. But that doesn't change the fact that it still hasn't been shown. Please, based off everything that I've shown. So finally, my message to the anti-reversal party. The beyond reversal party. I just think that we agree on way more than we disagree. And I don't, I don't know, Mike. We probably do, but we disagree with a lot of shit over here. I'm sorry. Like, this is, ooh. I mean, he's probably right, but like, there's so there's so much we just like please let's just talk mike i mean you don't have to like me you really don't have to like me but it's very clear we're capable of having a respectful conversation there is a recorded debate with us mike and i didn't call you any names i i didn't uh, i addressed all of your questions i addressed all your concerns as ev as recorded when the moderator asked that everyone feel like they had, everything was addressed like, it w it's on recording it's evident that we are capable of having a respectful conversation, despite me being disrespectful um, in this rightfully or wrongfully in this video. Hopefully, I doubt it, but hopefully uh, some of these points you agree with, probably not. All right, let me know. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you guys think down below of all of this. I already know that most of my viewers want to believe that a vegan diet reverses heart disease. I agree with that. Yeah. I think you want to believe it and your viewers want to believe it really strongly. Heart disease or a plant-based diet reverses heart disease. And for me, you know, it's been a journey seeing all of the data. So let me know what you, what you got. Hopefully you continue the journey, Mike. Hopefully you continue it with dialogue. You guys think about this. Do you think this is a valid definition of reversal of heart disease? If not, let me know why. What, again, what definition? I, whether or not a plant-based diet reverses heart disease, if it does, that doesn't mean that you should just ditch all modern medicine. They they seem to work really well together. And as usual, feel free. I really wish, when he says that, I really wish he would go to this comment and say that. The yeah. number one upvoted comment in his video, Mike, if you're watching, the number one upvoted comment in your video is this. I'll just point it out again. Is a patient who has decided to ditch their statins to go whole food plant-based diet to reverse their hearts. I wish you would either address it or remove the comment or something because this is what it's fostering. This is being encouraged. If you don't, okay. But hopefully you'll, if there's any one thing you can do, Mike, if, if you don't want to talk to me, that's fine. If you don't want to, um, if you don't want to have a discussion, if you want to misrepresent me, or if you don't want to misrepresent me and you're doing it anyway, you just don't care about it because you don't like me so much at least do this mike at least go to this comment and point out that you strongly disagree with what this person is doing and what this person is encouraging okay that's the number one upvoted comment on your video if there's one thing i can ask you mike because it's one thing that this is a this is not true this is a myth this is pseudoscience run amok in our community this is fostering something dangerous and it's doing it on your channel please do something about this i'm begging you Okay. Feel free to like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one, which will not be nearly as long. I have a feeling if he makes another response video to my video, instead of engaging with me, it will be not only this long, but longer. Okay.
Does anyone have any, should we bring people into like the, oh, I'll just make the same offer, by the way. Like if anyone wants to debate me on this, if anyone thinks Mike is right and they want to debate me on this, do you want to go into the Discord server? I know, we, I don't know how much time. Um, I have uh, some people who asked questions in, yeah, sure. uh, in my stream labs. So Liam R yeah, made $5. Yeah. Hey Avi, if you were to summarize this in layman's terms so we can spread this to all our non-scientific mm -hmm. vegan friends, how would you do so? Also, do you have any inter sorry, any intentions on publishing a paper on this? PS more bikini double bicep mm -hmm. shot, please. <laughs> okay, so the the answer to the, to the first well, um the answer to the first I'll just start with the second question because that's easiest. Yes, we intend on publishing a paper on this. Um, the answer to the first question is layman terms, making it really, really simple. The vegan diet, the whole food, whole food, well-balanced, whole food plant-based diet can prevent things from getting worse. It can reduce events. It can do the things that matter. It can make you healthier. It can go beyond reversal. It can stop you from getting heart attacks. It can reduce your risk of getting heart attacks, reduce your risk of getting strokes, reduce your risk of uh, of dying from heart disease, the things that matter. Re making it really simple, positive message that doesn't lie, think beyond a reversal, doing the things that matter. That's all we need. And that's better than claiming reversal. All right, so there's a second question. Nikki Espinoso donated $2. Hey, Avi, bypass surgery has not been shown in studies to be effective at treating vegans heart disease. Why do you claim procedures are effective that haven't been shown to be effective in studies? Studies aren't everything. Why won't you talk mechanisms? Okay, so yeah. Nikki Espinosa has been commenting on my video saying all sorts of nonsense. Um, so Nikki, it depends on which study you're looking at. So yes, yeah, some studies um, have not shown uh, a benefit of bypass, but it depends on the extent of the and severity of the uh, of the of the disease is how multivessel it, it is, how the degree of severity it is, and if and also really what it depends on if it's ACS. If there's an ACS, if there's a um, if the patient is presenting from a myocardial infarction, not just like an, an asymptomatic. So in asymptomatic um, stenoses, um, there are a by, there have been studies showing like bypass won't really help, um, but in a symptomatic stenosis, yes, a bypass does help. In a patient presenting with an ACS, with ACS, yes, a bypass ha can, has been shown to help. It, it depends on the context, Nikki. Um, also, Nikki, because um, I think I remember you and you're the one who claimed this, I don't promote fish, okay? And neither does Danielle for ethical reasons. She's just being honest about what the data shows. Anyway. All right. Um, do you think it's worth opening up the Discord or... I don't know. What do you, what does the chat think? Um, do you guys do, well, let's just get anyone, like, does anyone serious in the chat want to debate me? Let's just see, like, if no one serious in the chat thinks Mike is right and wants to debate me, then we don't need to open up the Discord. Um, but if you have people in the chat that are, like, serious contenders and think I'm wrong and they want to debate me, fine. Okay, Brian King donated two dollars. Avi's intelligence made me feel small, lol, well done, but I still like Mike. Well have done the poor judgment thing again. Bravo, Doc. My money is still on whole food plant-based diet as opposed to the sad diet. I don't I know. I agree. My I money's think, on the whole food plant-based diet too. But yeah, I mean. Yeah, I think Mike is acting in Mike, really like, bad faith here. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree with that too. I think, look, Mike, and by the way, it, when if any time you want to change and have a conversation with me, I'm willing to let it all go. I just want to say that too. I'm willing to drop all of it. I'm willing to stop every all the rudeness I'm doing on my end if you'll actually engage with me. If you'll actually have a conversation, I'm willing to take it all away. I'm willing to let it all go. If you are too. El Tigre is asking if you're Jewish. <laughs> well, with a name like Avi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, what about yeah. oil? I, I think some people want you to kind of talk about yeah. whether or not oil's healthy. Yeah, so, um, so the studies that look at diets that have oil in them, they haven't been shown to have this horrifying thing that people in the plant-based, low-fat, whole-food, plant-based diet community is, are suggesting. Um, they just don't. Uh, in fact, the, in the Leon Diet Heart Study, they were consuming uh, 
I forget, uh, around 15 grams of oil a day in the experimental group. And they showed, if you actually do an apples to apples comparison, they showed similar uh, re uh, event rates as the Esselstyn study. And I'm not talking about his subgroup of the subgroup that he says is 0.6%. That was very dishonest. When you actually do an appropriate comparison, uh, the results are similar. So it's clearly not the case that um, there's an advantage. It doesn't seem like there's any advantage of avoiding oil compared to uh, 15 grams of oil averaged a day. I don't see why would there would be any reason for one advantage over the other for those two diets. The results are similar. So no, I don't take the view that oil is unhealthy. I'm not saying, now look, at some point, if you guzzle enough oil, there are gonna be problems. So I'm not yeah. saying to do that either. Um, that, that's my view. It's, it's there's just, just like there's moderation. There's not like even with, really yeah. any reason to think that something like olive oil would increase risk of heart disease. Like it doesn't really affect Correct. your triglycerides or cholesterol. So at normal doses, like, okay, there's a little tablespoon on my salad. It, there's no reason to think it would do anything. Correct. And it's not, it's not like this issue of like, oh, compared to any oil, like, okay, like if, if you were to do something like olive oil, it's better than you know, it's not so bad, but it's like better. It's not as good as no oil. Like, no, like if you like equate everything, um, if you equate all else held equal, I don't see a difference in risk between adding oil or some amount of adding 15 grams of oil a day versus not adding 15 grams of oil a day. I okay. just don't. Somebody in the chat is saying canola, canola oil and vegetable oil is too high in omega-6. Do you want to comment on like omega-6 to 3 ratio and different oils? Yes. Yeah. So, so omega-6, and uh, first of all, no one knows the ideal ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. People have been trying to, there have been people who have tried to say that they know and what the range should be for omega-6 to omega-3. No one actually knows this answer. Um, they just don't. Um, and when you look at primary, uh, I'm not talking about secondary, when you look at the latest Cochrane review for primary prevention of heart disease, there's no statistically significant improvement in supplementing with omega-3s even in the American studies that have high, uh, already baseline have high omega-6 to omega-3 concentration. Um, there's improvement in secondary prevention studies that just make statistical significant results for some endpoints. But in primary prevention, if you're a healthy individual, I actually don't see the benefit. And I don't know, I don't actually know what the ideal omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is. And nor does any, I don't really think anyone else does either. How's that for a nuclear take? In, yeah, I, I've in seen one really paper. I, I've seen one paper that said four to one is ideal for all cause, but for cause specific, there's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like one to one's best for heart disease, things like that. But I, I th there are papers that throw out these numbers, and I haven't been able to find any solid justification for the numbers. Like that, that's based on any real good robust data. Um, a lot of t some papers throw out the numbers and they just assert them like from like an expert opinion. Um, maybe there are some papers that have it on, if, if there's any papers on robust data for this, I'd be interested in looking at it. Um, but anyway. And uh, Chris asks any negative effect of oil on gut flora. There's so little we know about gut flora to yeah. begin with. Um, like you know, I, I'm not aware of uh, negative effects of oil on, on gut flora. Um, like, no, I'm not aware of it. Um, I'm sure it's possible, but I'm not like any more likely than otherwise. I don't know. I have okay. Not Here's a question that I'm not sure if you'll be able to uh, answer. Can a mm -hmm. Rasengan help with CVD? <laughs> I'm probably not able to answer that. I don't know what. <laughs> I don't know. It's, a, it's an attack from Naruto. <laughs> okay, I don't even know what that yeah. is. <laughs> I'm lost. No, sorry. Right. Um. So, uh, okay, here's here's a good one. I think this will be the last one. Isn't mono unsaturated better than poly unsaturated? So, um, I'm not sure. I think a combination of mono and poly would probably be ideal, but I don't have any good comparative data comparing like mono and, and poly. There's different things like for oxidized cholesterol, it's interesting, actually uh, mono did better than poly for several metrics uh, of cholesterol oxidation. But like, again, for preventing CBD events, I don't actually know. I think I think a good combination would probably be ideal, but I'd have to actually review the, any robust data actually comparing uh, MUFAs and PUFAs. But I would not recommend just doing MUFA or just doing PUFA. I would, for, to, for the sake of playing things safe, I would do MUFAs and PUFAs and just avoid or decrease SFAs. That yeah, seems sure. to be the safest bet based on the literature I've seen. 
And uh, okay, how about this uh, as a last question? Isn't getting mm -hmm. uh, fat from nuts and seeds uh, more beneficial than having, uh, you know, getting fats from oils? I don't know that. I actually don't know that that's the case. Um, I haven't seen any robust data looking at like, people have this idea like, oh, if it's a, if we're getting the fat from a whole food instead of a non whole food like oil, then it must be better, right? Well, whole food is a good heuristic. It's not a law. There are certain things that are not whole foods that probably are better than whole foods, like uh, protein powder for people with sarcopenia, for example, um, and depending on the context. So I actually don't know. I don't know the answer to this. People have speculated that there's certain specific types of polyphenols and extra virgin olive oil that's accounting for the reduced risk of heart disease. I don't know if that's true, um, but those specific, do those specific types of polyphenols uh, also occur in the nuts? I don't know. I don't know that I have I seen any robust data comparing people who get their fats from whole, whole food nuts versus olive oil. No, I haven't. Um, and I don't think anyone has. So I don't to, let's just be honest about it. I don't know the answer to it. Neither does anyone else. All right. OK, so I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, <clears throat> thanks for coming on, Avi. I will link sure. Avi's channel in the description. Uh, if any of you like I, I'd highly recommend going to Avi's channel, really smart guy. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll have you on more often for these sorts of things. And... Also, link if you can. Uh, can, you, can you link the uh, Discord server also? Because all of oh, my yeah, work sure. and the, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And That's if anyone idea. wants to follow along with the studies, so my channel and my Discord server. Yeah, yeah awesome. Okay, uh, we'll be sure to do that. And of course, the stream is going to stay public if uh, anyone came late, didn't catch everything. And um, yeah, like, of course, you know, the debate offer is still open to Mike, right? So anytime yep. he wants to debate, he can come on. Okay, well, uh, please take care. do not. I'll just last plea to Mike. What? Like, please don't have us waste our time going to vid response video to response video to response video to response video. Like, just engage. Let's not do play. Like, I I'll do it. I'll keep doing it. If we need to do response video to response video, I'll, I'll, whatever, fine. But you're gonna save a lot of. If your goal is to get closer to the truth, if you care about truth more than you don't like me. You're going to do it a lot quicker, and it's going to save us both a lot of time if you just engage with me, publicly or privately. Yeah. Offers on the table. Okay, so take care, everybody. Hope you all enjoyed the stream.